Is it Maryland gypsy. all the time? An architectural I'm sorry? gypsy. An architectural gypsy. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's a good word. Thank you all. How's the pandemic in China? Um, is you guys seeing the end of it? What, what, what's, what's the situation? I've not been following the news. Yeah, it's definitely um, zero right now, but the government uh, government's control is very, very strict. So we have app um, scanning every single movement. So we're all tracked. That's oh. why we're um, currently zero. And finally, um, vaccine start in the, around the community. I think expat, because I'm an expat in China. Uh -huh. So expat has to wait um, longer before um, Chinese national goes through all, most majority, and then we can start. And most of us want to wait for uh, Pfizer uh -huh. and waiting for the approval. Yeah. What about Su Chen? He is also fine. Um, he also works in uh, Gensler. So um, we're the Gensler couples. <laughs> <laughs> Would you please give him my best when you see him? Yes, I will. Great. I, I see we he have. Just uh, room next. Yeah, sorry. I, I see we have some more jurors that have, have arrived and want to be sure we uh, acknowledge them. Marcus, good morning. Good to see everybody. And then uh, Vince, great to see you. See you, Drew. Nice to see you. How have you been? I've been well, thank you. It's been a little while, <clears throat> um, but get get lots of news through through your colleagues, of course, about all of you and uh, all the great work you guys are doing. So, but it's great to great to have you here. Also, hi, Dina. Thanks for oh, joining yeah. us. Good morning, everyone. Good to I see this you. Morning. Hello to Matt, long time. Probably doesn't remember, but I was actually a student of his way back when. At University Are you kidding? Of Are you kidding? I don't remember you. Please, I can name everybody in your class. <laughs> I could pick them out at a hundred paces in a dense fog. I mean, come on. <laughs> your class? Are you kidding? It was a fun class. Nice to see. Yeah, a lot of characters. Nice to see you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. And hey, Dana, thanks for joining. Thank you for having me, everyone. We'll get started in just another minute. Um, I think we have all we the, have the jury. here. And let me, yeah, let's just double check the jury. I think we're all here. Um, yeah, so why don't we, yeah, why don't we dive in then? Terrific. Um, just uh, very, very briefly, uh, I'm, I'm James Tillman. I'm on the faculty here at Maryland and, and Lindsay, Lindsay May, um, our assistant director. Uh, we're we're co-coordinating this uh, thesis cohort this semester. It's a cohort of 20. Um, and so we've been having uh, an extraordinary uh, week uh, with thesis projects. It's been a, it's been a fantastic journey. Um, just very briefly, the, the format uh, for everybody is that is that the presentation there was so the, the slots are one hour, uh, maybe a little bit less. Uh, we have a, a pre recorded video each presentation by each candidate is is recorded so you'll see a, a recording first, and then we transition to a mural uh, board and the candidate will orient everybody. They will share their screen and you will see the mural board. You will also get a link in the chat function on Zoom um, so that you can go and, and click and, and uh, zoom in on whatever drawings you would like to independently. Um, so that's the general uh, format. Um, and so what we like to do is just uh, have our distinguished guests uh, briefly introduce themselves before we, uh, before we kick things off. Um, and you all appear there um, uh, on the uh, slide that's up, up now. So I guess we'll, uh, we'll, we'll just go, uh, go in order. So uh, Emma, be great to hear from you. 
Sorry, um, I missed a second. We were going to introduce ourselves. Yeah, just uh, briefly, yeah. Uh, everybody's going to introduce themselves on the jury. Thanks. Yeah. And uh, hello, everyone. I'm Emma Chan. Um, used to call Shi Chen because that's how everybody <laughs> know me. And uh, my name really causing a lot of trouble to, in the real work because <laughs> she sounds like she. Um, I'm currently working from Gensler, Beijing. Um, I work at different Gensler locations, um, Washington, DC, Shanghai, and currently in Beijing. I'm a design director, mostly in interior. And that interior studio has mostly focusing on um, uh, landlord service and repositioning um, plus workplace. So um, I'm a Maryland graduate uh, in 2000 and I spent a um, semester in, um, in Rome with all the professors, Matt Bell, Brian Kelly, and so forth. And nice to meet everyone. And I'm really excited from Beijing which is 12 hours away. Thank you for being here, Emma. Terrific. Huh? Yeah. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Okay, um, uh, Zena Howard, welcome. Hi, yes, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good to see everybody. Excited to be here today and nice to meet uh, the other distinguished guest. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. I've been, um, at uh, University of Maryland last two years, I was the key distinguished uh, lecturer or uh, distinguished lecturer, I think in 2019. And then um, I had the, the privilege also of uh, participating last year in 2020. So it's really great to see you guys, to see um, the work. I'm excited about that. I am a um, the principal of uh, Perkins and Will and managing director of our North Carolina studios. And um, I also lead our, our cultural practice and um, have been, uh, you know, with um, uh, Perkins and Will through um, an acquisition of a firm I was with, a partner with Freelon Group um, for probably the past eight, I think it's going on 18 years now, I stopped counting. And um, so wonderful to be here uh, back at, at University of Maryland again. And the only regret is that we cannot be there in person, but soon, right? Zena, we'll rec rectify that. And as I've been telling people that are key professors, once a key professor, always a key professor. So okay. we, can, we can get you to come back and visit with us in person down the road. Look forward to it. Very good. Uh, Marcus. Yes. Um, uh, echo the sentiments of the previous uh, previous guests. Uh, excited to be here. Excited to to look at these great projects. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm Marcus King. I am a um, Terp. I'm alumnus of uh, the um, School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation. Uh, I currently reside in Detroit, where I'm an architect and developer, uh, mainly through my firm, uh, Fabric Design, a small scale architectural uh, firm I, uh, based out of here in Detroit. Um, uh, and um, I'll just leave it at that. I'll keep it short and sweet, you know, excited to be here and, and um, uh, review some of these projects. And, and you're being modest. You're, uh, you're this year's key distinguished professor. Come on. Yes. yes yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you. There you go. Um, Vince. I am Vince Lee. I'm an associate partner at Rogers Partners in New York, architects and urban designers. Um, happy to be here. I'm actually a graduate of uh, Maryland architecture undergrad, 86. Um, and been in New York for about 23, 24 years now. Um, uh, work all over the country on a whole variety of kinds of projects. We, we pride ourselves in being non-specialist, uh, sort of taking on the projects we think are important and interest us, um, where we can make a difference. Thank you. Vince, your firm did that fantastic school in Baltimore. So we did. Shoot your, yeah. your own horn there. Come on. I'm gonna have to coach <laughs> these guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're we're definitely setting the table. Um, <laughs> 
uh, Dana McKinney. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Dana. Um, I am an architect and urban planner in Los Angeles at Gary Partners. So it's 530 in the morning here. I forgot what time it would be when I commit to this. So just waiting yeah. a cup of tea right now. Um, but I am uh, working a lot on the LA River in the master plan that is about 51 miles in the county right now and all the projects uh, that flank the river basically. So cultural facilities, parks, open space, habitats, the whole shebang. Uh, and I'm just really glad to be here today and thank you guys so much for having me. Thank you for being here so early, Dana. Although Emma's got you beat. <laughs> yeah, 12 hours to China. That's yeah. That's yeah. pretty far. Yeah, that's late yeah. and early. Is it late? What yes, time it is it's late. It's late. Okay. Twelve hours ahead. <laughs> so uh, terrific. Well, thank you all so much for for joining us. Uh, we're we're greatly looking forward to this. And so, um, without further ado, I think uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, hear from our first thesis candidate, uh, Melanie uh, Quintanilla. We're muted. You're right. I was muted. My mistake. There All right. Go. Take two. Good morning, everybody. My name is Melanie Kinton. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge some of the people who made this possible. First, thank you to my family, my partner, and my friends for your love and support. Thank you, Professor Noonan and Professor Tillman for your expert guidance. And a huge thank you to my mentors at Air St. Gross who helped shape this thesis. Finally, my gratitude goes to the people of Harlem Park who were kind enough to spend their precious time with me. With that being said, I'm proud to present my thesis, Strong Foundations. As we face the twin pandemics of COVID-19 and racism, there's been a national reckoning of racial disparity in the United States. What saddened me was that these same disparities found in adulthood are found even in childhood. But what if we could address that gap early on? This brought me to the central question of my thesis. What is the role of educational architecture in both repairing a community harmed by discriminatory design and lessening racial disparities in education? With the West Baltimore neighborhood of Harlem Park, pictured to the right, as a case study representing similar urban communities across the US. Looking specifically at historic maps of Baltimore, over time, the forces of racism have undeniably shaped the built environment of the city, as well as the neighborhood of Harlem Park, outlined in this black trapezoid on the 1860 map. Before the Civil War, Baltimore had the highest number of free black residents of any city in the US. After slavery, which was one of the economic forces allowing the city to expand, Baltimore was the first city to establish racial zoning in the US with the West Ordinance in 1910, which outlawed black residents moving onto a city block from moving onto a city block with majority white residents. Throughout the following decades, segregated schools provided unequal education for generations of black children. And the racial zoning was eventually struck down by courts, but it was reborn as redlining, which segregated black residents and devalued their homes. Publicly accessible green space was kept outside of these quote unquote hazardous neighborhoods. And urban renewal as seen in this highway master plan for Baltimore, ran freeways either through these black neighborhoods or around them as borders. Residential only zoning also began to outlaw small businesses in black neighborhoods, which you can see on the zoning map that shows residential only zones as white. Even after these intentional laws were removed, the black population between 1975 and now sees the same segregated distribution known as the black butterfly spreading from east to west. And this same pattern can also describe the income level of residents proving wealth disparity in the present day. The Hong Park neighborhood in particular suffered from the effects of urban renewal in the 1960s. 
in this first full-scale federal urban renewal project in the United States. 25% of the neighborhood population was intentionally displaced to make way for the three block school complex in the center, highlighted in yellow, a baseball field that halved the original area of the historic Harlem Square Park. Route 40, AKA the highway to nowhere, a sunken freeway to the south, and 29 inner block parks that left stagnant hidden spaces disconnected from the street facing culture. The creation of Route 40 and this school complex in a single targeted design move really sacrificed an intentionally segregated Black neighborhood for the convenience of the predominantly white suburban communities. Between its beginning in the mid 1800s and the current day, you can clearly see how Harlem Park's urban fabric was gutted by urban renewal and left to rot. Once solidly defined blocks now have hollowed cores and crumbling edges. The design decisions of urban renewal ignored resident protests and a lawsuit by the NAACP, cutting off street connectivity, particularly around the central school complex and with Route 40 highlighted in pink here. Urban renewal also destroyed the inner block carriage homes that once served as smaller affordable housing for both European immigrants and later fleed black residents. Urban renewal also consolidated neighborhood schools into the oversized jail-like school complex. As a result, there's currently widespread vacancy in the neighborhood with around 30% of the homes abandoned. And the once vibrant streets of Harlem Park as seen in this picture in the 1950s are now abandoned in the present. A walk through Harlem Park today reveals boarded vacant homes, unkempt inner block parks that often serve as illegal dumping grounds, an unwelcoming defensive school protected by a trench, and literal scars in the earth from the main high school entrance path that runs through the center of Harlem Square Park, which rams through the historic, formerly picturesque setting, and it mirrors the sunken scar of Route 40 a few blocks away. The rupture caused by racist policies and design decisions must be confronted in order to transform these neighborhood scars into neighborhood healing. I think that Harlem Park's story is ultimately about a loss of connection. Urban renewal did not just disconnect the literal roadways and sidewalks, but it also disconnected the built environment from history, green space, and the humanity of its Black inhabitants. These ruptures dictated my design goals of reversing the effects of urban renewal by repairing the inner block structure, preserving and memorializing the collective memory of the neighborhood, reopening access to well-maintained healing green space and water features, challenging the historic segregation of these spaces, and confronting racist policies by shaping neighborhood self-sufficiency, celebrating Black culture, and promoting trust and respect of Harlem Park residents. In order to determine the potential for change on the site, design parameters were established. Baltimore's low student population and Harlem Park's close proximity to Francis M. Wood High School meant that the original 570,000 square foot school complex, sized for 2,000 pre-K through 12 students in the 1960s, could be reduced to a one block 180,000 square foot school to serve the current 306 students and a projected number of 425 K through eight students to account for neighborhood growth after development. The 403 current Augusta Fells High School students can attend the similarly oversized and underpopulated Francis M. Wood High School three blocks south. This leaves the two Southern blocks of the Harlem Park School Complex site open to community development and the baseball field side of Harlem Park could be converted back to a picturesque landscape. With this reduction, reconnection will be possible at the community, school, and resident scales. At the community scale, the new Harlem Park neighborhood core will reconnect to history by restoring the broken street grid, reintroducing the smaller, more affordable inner block housing in a new form with side yards inspired by Charleston homes, and the site transformation will restore the original bounds of Harlem Square Park by converting the trench of the school entrance path to a pond. 
green space will be woven through the site by establishing a street accessible linear park, linking Harlem Square Park and the neighborhood school. And two new water features, the lake in Harlem Square Park and the small reflecting pool near the school will capture and filter runoff as well as encourage contemplation and healing. Removing the residential only zoning established in the 1950s to target the black small businesses would also allow the neighborhood to address the needs of the community and become self-sufficient. A new grocery store, a pharmacy, and space for small businesses and restaurants were specifically requested by Harlem Park residents I spoke to last summer. At the building scale, the existing complex, outlined here in red, for all its negative association to urban renewal, is still a physical link to the past. Keeping this northern L of the complex and literally connecting to this past runs counter to the harmful blank slate philosophy of urban renewal. And it reminds me of one of the things I love most about Black culture. Our ability to transform what's considered undesirable or make something out of nothing. Many of our cultural practices from soul food to collage art to quilting started with scraps and leftovers. So I see a transformation of this portion of the school complex as an opportunity to reclaim the built heritage of Holland Park. The core technique to transform the existing L is a reversal of the traditional frame and shell of Harlem Park's romance. Instead of building the frame first and surrounding it with the brick shell, working out from the existing brick shell of the old portion of the school complex is a new framework that weaves into the existing structure and adds light, transparency, and flexibility. Besides the ecological benefits of adaptive reuse, the new wing of the school connects to green space by framing the centerpiece of this new K-8 school, the Mitchell Memorial Courtyard, honoring Clarence and Perry Mitchell, two Harlem Park residents that advocated against urban renewal in their roles as NAACP activists and a congressman, respectively. Students can learn about urban farming in the courtyard orchard that hosts apple and peach trees, they could look out into the courtyard from the circulation space of the upper levels, or attend 4-H club and grow greens, corn, sweet potatoes, and beans on the cultivated green roof of the Northern Wing, or learn about solar panels with the accessible rooftop array above the Southern Wing. The school building reconnects to humanity programmatically by serving as a community resource. The existing OWL recently had its HVAC and electrical systems updated, so saving the building is also saving the investment already made by the community and freeing up funds to go towards the school's community serving program. There's public program in this new North Wing and the expanded South Wing piloted in purple that can be opened independently from the school. Three major community gathering spaces anchor the corners of the building and activate the internal main street that runs throughout the school. The auditorium here in purple, the library in blue and the gymnasium in orange. New program located mostly in this new North Wing include the library in blue, a kitchen slash food pantry here in red, the main street space highlighted in green that also acts as a gallery, cafeteria and informal presentation space and maker spaces in orange for art and manufacturing that can open out into the courtyard. On the second floor, there are teacher and student workrooms here in yellow some of which could be rented out to community members outside of school hours. There are also new computer labs that could be also job training space and an auditorium in purple for students and community theater or concerts. As requested by residents, this new program allows the school to not just be a 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. space. It would remain active outside of school hours and in the summer. The transformation tactic for the existing building also manipulates this prescriptive double-loaded corridor layout. It starts to shape internal streets and stoops and collaborative gathering spaces for students and the entire community to just be. Looking at the human scale of the new linear park, as you walk from the Harlem Square Park pond to the school, bricks from the demolished high school portion of the complex will start to form the path underfoot and bronze lanterns representing the 1,140 people displaced by urban renewal will light the entire length of the path at night, including in front of the new Urban Renewal Museum, whose top floor would host the Harlem Park Community Development Corporation, 
an organization that currently links designers and developers to neighborhood residents and issues RFPs for community projects in Harlem Park. The plants chosen for this linear park also have historic connections, like the Southern Live Oak, which provided shelter and were symbols of resilience for former slaves, or a local variety of wild rice, which provided them sustenance and can be harvested and eaten. In the building itself, the infrastructure of the past and the new framework weave together to provide a spectrum between old and new. Students traveling between the existing wings and the new northern wing can literally touch the walls of the old school building. In the Mitchell Memorial Courtyard, trees and a new blue land framework come together to shape a safe space for kids to explore and learn about natural features without needing extensive field trips. A shallow reflecting pool near the school would link to the linear park stream and the larger pond of Harlem Square Park to the south of the site when it rains, but in the drier months, it could serve as a storytelling space where younger generations can hear from neighborhood elders. Regrading and new entrances restore the school's connection to the street, eliminate the moat, and form the new community stoop, as well as the new school porch. Embracing both stoop and porch as important cultural symbols for Baltimore's Black community. Inside the school, it is now welcoming, honest, and trusting, prioritizing light and air, comfort, collaborative gathering space, and playfulness, all characteristics of school buildings that are proven to raise student attendance and success and inspire a lifelong love of learning. Together, the multi-scaled series of design decisions that I've mentioned we restore the connection between Harlem Park West Baltimore's built context and its rich history, accessible green space, and the humanity of its predominantly Black residents. It's my hope that the site and school transformation will begin to reverse the arc of urban renewal, heal the heart of a community harmed by discriminatory design, and lessen racial disparities in education. Thank you. And now to the mural. Oh, yeah, I'm just jump in as you're changing uh, over to to put up your mural uh, and say I, I think it's long overdue that students uh, figure out the backdrop should be their their thesis setting I, before you even showed the interior I kept saying what is that wonderful place that she's in and and then, and then you just revealed it and it's like oh fantastic so kudos great job thank you uh, yeah. <laughs> right. Great. So once the mural is up, we will uh, go ahead and uh, and begin our dialogue. So uh, handing it over to our uh, distinguished guests. Looking forward to it. Go. Just trying to figure out how to unmute here. Melody, nice to see your face. Uh, I had the opportunity to speak to you a little earlier in this, and I have to say, uh, for one conversation and um, and and just dumping a bunch of stuff on you, I, uh, I'm really impressed. You you found all the right kernels in in what I sent you um, in in terms of your analysis, and I'm so glad to see this. Not only um, that I have the privilege of doing that school in East Baltimore, but I actually grew up just southwest of here and then lived ju just a little southeast of here. So I know this area well and uh, was in the Baltimore city school system and would have gone to Edmondson High School if I had stayed. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I mean, your analysis of, of, the, of the effect, particularly of Route 40, um, you know, that east-west gash um, interrupting the, the predominant north-south grid of Baltimore was, was so damaging. Um, and and uh, really glad to see um, your effort to, to reconnect the neighborhood here. Thank you, Vince. I, I really took everything you said to heart and poured through all the drawings you sent me. So thank you so much for your input and you really helped me along the way. Absolutely. Hi, Melanie. This is Zena and it's, it's really great to see you again. <laughs> um, and by the way, I'm looking at a larger screen, so I'm 
you're probably staring at my profile, but it's, it's great to see this uh, in, a, in a fuller view. Um, I really appreciate the level of, of thought and context, cultural sensitivity, environmental sensitivity, everything that you brought um, to, to, you know, sort of thinking about the form of this. I had a couple questions for you. Um, the first one is, could you uh, talk a little bit more about your choice of material um, as you, you know, kind of uh, extracted out the structure of, of the L-shaped school um, and, and homage to the past, but, but uh, uh, combination of wood. And, and so if you can talk about that, particularly in your, your uh, perspective views. Uh, to, to the right there. And then the second question, and you can probably address it at the same time, is um, the, uh, I love the way that, that you thought about, you know, that, that uh, restoring the baseball field back to the, to the courtyard and the garden, and, and really showed some great views um, that I don't see here, but I saw that what was in your um, video of the pedestrian life, like how is this contributing to um, relating to uh, the neighborhood. You put certain programs at the street level, which were great, um, library auditorium. I love the museum of, uh, of um, urban renewal. Wow, what a fantastic, you need to run with that. <laughs> um, but you, you put some great programs at the, at the ground level. Um, but I I'm, I'm wanna make sure, and you did wonderful, uh, gave some wonderful thought about the inter interior corridors and how the building relates to each other, um, you know, from an internal perspective, more insular. But can you talk more about how, how this, this um, the imagining of this building contributes and activates the street and community life there uh, a little better? So I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, um, so I think for your first question, maybe, I guess it is kind of a combination of both. Uh, as I talked about kind of the framework and stretching that wood framework out and kind of creating almost like an organic growth of framework that could then be manipulated later on when somebody else comes to maybe adapt or re reuse my design. Uh, then I thought of kind of these core uh, programs, like the auditorium can't exactly be a, a wide open uh, glass and wood space. Um, so I, I went back and forth on that. I decided between uh, maybe it could be brick, but it looked exactly like kind of the original building. Maybe it could be like a black brick, but that seemed kind of artificial application. And then I found uh, bronze and I really loved how the material changed over time. Uh, it kind of got the, the patina uh, uh, that goes from maybe almost like a brick toned metal. And then over the years, it becomes this dark uh, sort of material. So I thought it spoke to the link of between time that I'm kind of playing with in the design. Uh, then to your second question about how this maybe starts to activate the street and the neighborhood, uh, I think a big kind of problem with these 1960s era schools is that they're very inwards facing, that they shut themselves off and it's clear from the moat and from the selection of fenestration uh, that it's it's meant to shut you off from the outside. So I think having the openness, the glassiness, uh, where people can peer inside and be like, oh, somebody's making art in there. Like, I want to try it out. I want to join. Uh, could kind of help to activate the street. So hopefully these answer your questions. <laughs> now, yeah, Melanie, can you, can you, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Gina. Oh, no, go ahead. Uh, just, can uh, you expand, uh, you know, the one of the really tricky things is, and I think you really tried to tackle it, is, you know, you get away from the knee-jerk reaction of the, the protective school, right? You know, it, it, one of the great conversations is someone from a neighborhood saying, who are you protecting the kids from? They're mine, you know? And, uh, but there is real, there, you know, there are edge specs and there are real needs for security and finding that balance between being inviting and while while providing the needs and the security that are required. Can you talk about a little bit about how you're opening to the neighborhood address that? Yeah, yeah. So I'd say kind of the balance between security and still having the openness, let's see. Uh, for one, I guess the kind of the nature of the topography uh, and the way that this entrance kind of ent 
drops you off at the second floor rather than that ground floor, which is partially underground, kind of made that base uh, necessary. And it means that when you're walking at the street level, it's not completely open at the street level. There's almost like a clerestory window strip that goes down and becomes more open. Uh, so it's not completely like a glass see-through thing. There is still a uh, necessary kind of base layer there. And I think secondly, the grading of the site, like this strip down here, let's see if I can zoom in closer. Uh, it's actually almost like a berm that lifts the school up. So there is a grade change here uh, that would kind of prevent people from <laughs> just walking directly. It's not completely flat onto the school playground uh, or the kind of school play area. Great. And hey, Melanie. Um, uh, first, let me say that I, um, I think, uh, think it, I can't remember what review um, um, I was on uh, when I first saw these sort of ideas sort of percolate in your head and, and um, sort of get out there. Um, but I do see a lot of things that, you know, we sort of discussed, you know, through our time together the last, last semester. And, and, I, and I think they've come out beautifully, um, particularly in the, the connective narrative that you created, um, um, you know, connecting history to these sort of contemporary issues that, that I think are, are issues in, in, in many of our cities, but particularly here in Baltimore with this rich history of um, how it has shaped uh, in particular black neighborhoods. Um, and you sort of, sort of focus here on Harlem Park. And I, I really love the narrative that, that, you, that you created also that sort of attaches itself to that you know, about this, this sort of uh, uh, sentiment within, uh, I think, Black culture to sort of take things that, you know, people sort of uh, toss by the wayside um, and, you know, have culture, have through, through necessity sort of create these things out of this, these beautiful things out of necessity and tying that to this sort of, um, you know, for lack of a better word, um, you know, ugly, you know, night, you know, mid-century school building and sort of opening it up. Uh, I really love the narrative that that you created here. Um, my main comment is is less of a criticism and more of how I think you know, you know, you could sort of get back in here because I, I really love the architecture. You know, I'll, I'll, uh, just as uh, others have commented on, but I think this project is is one of those projects that sort of. Um, is at the mercy of the constraints of a thesis, right? You can only focus on so much at, at one time, right? Um, but you started off really beautifully talking about all these sort of broader urban issues and laying that framework out, you know, talking about the highways and the freeways. Um, and I really think what would help to highlight this, this beautiful adaptive reuse project that, you, that you've done is sort of get in there and, and actually make those urban reconnections that that you talked about so eloquently um, in the beginning. Um, um, you know, what what happens with that connective tissue on the highway? You know, again, this is not a, not a criticism. Again, it's, you know, re realizing and recognizing that you only have so much time with the thesis. Um, my favorite part of, of this project is really about, and, and where I think there's an opportunity um, is this, the, the replacement masses for the high school that you took away. I really love that piece because, you know, it, it, it sort of alludes to the sort of support structure from a population standpoint that needs to happen here to make that larger institution building sort of function and, and, and happen, right? You know, having those rooftops, having those people um, and, and, having, and having them reside in sort of this multi-use, multifaceted, you know, from a theoretical standpoint, affordable because you're, you know, you're providing different types and, and, and different building types and things like that. You know, this sort of affordable replacement for this larger high school piece. And it really would have been nice to sort of see what that sort of modern version of, from an architectural standpoint, what that modern version of, you know, these sort of historical types look like, you know, from, for, in your interpretation, like what is the, what is the 21st century version of a, 
um, um, you know, sort of, you know, carriage house with a main house in the front type typology in Baltimore. What does that look like now? I think we know they work, um, <clears throat> but but what are some of the modern things that, that we've learned as a society that can be incorporated in these building types to help, you know, bring these types of neighborhoods in the 21st century? So, you know, I'll just offer those, those comments up as things that you potentially want to think about to sort of connect all these different things that you've thrown out there together. Um, because I think they, they could only help this sort of anchor piece that you've decided to focus on for the thesis in, in the school building that has great programming. Uh, but then how do you sort of connect um, um, both from a programmatic standpoint, but also an architectural standpoint, all this other tissue around it uh, to, to really bring back the neighborhood that, you know, for lack, for lack of a better term has been you know, sort of ripped apart systematically, you know, over the course of decades. Um, but overall, I, I really, I really love where you ended up. Uh, a lot of information um, here, a lot of, a lot of nice information here, and, and um, um, really like the effort and the detail you've put into the, to the, uh, the primary building. Yeah. No, I think speaking to kind of your first point of reconnecting back to the community as a whole, that's something I really struggled with. Uh, first with scope creep, like <laughs> what happens if I suddenly have to redesign the entire neighborhood? Mm -hmm. uh, but I think something that I should have mentioned in my presentation is that I see this transformation of the school site kind of fit into a larger arc of change that's currently happening in Harlow Park. Mm -hmm. So I had the privilege to work on the Air St. Gross master plan for the neighborhood, where they're thinking of possibly uh, putting retail over Route 40 and kind of filling that gap, like a bridge of retail and uh, kind of uh, housing spaces. Uh, and there's also the red line, which uh, was recently vetoed, but could still come back up and sort of take the place of Route 40 and put mass transit there instead. So mm -hmm. I think uh, this is kind of like a, a kernel of change, I hope that would maybe inspire a broader reach as the neighborhood goes through its changes. Yeah. I mean, one thing, I was thinking about, I'm, I'm looking a lot at your sort of general site plan and the, the architecture of how you re kind of configured your building. And one thing you mentioned really early in your presentation was sort of extending the grid through and having people be able to kind of pass through. Um, and I do think that there's like some level of, um, of sort of like finessing you could have done in that site plan to really enable that passage. And so I'm looking specifically like at your auditorium placement, which I think is awesome to include. And, and by the way, I think your project is beautiful, like all around and like really searching for like nitpicky things to comment on. But um, you have this new sort of greenway extension to the park, I guess, to the south or yeah, to the south. Um, and you're kind of blocking that off to the community to the north because of that auditorium. Um, and so I, I, I feel like there could have been a little bit more sort of finessing just to kind of push that over so that the community to the north of the school could have been, quite easily had that sort of visual and physical connection to the park going south. Um, and then it, it's interesting because other people have commented on the fact that like a lot of these like 1960s schools are kind of blocking communities. And so now you're creating this, it was an L shape, so it had two exposed sides. And now you're creating this U that now only has the one exposed uh, opening to the to the yeah, to the east, and so um, I, I'm really enjoying the sort of um, we call it the uh, you say the stoop and the porch moments. And I think those are really cool. I'm just wondering though now is the new configuration of the school kind of um, dividing east to west, and so. Yeah, I don't know. Just, I'm just curious if you had any kind of thoughts about how you're anchoring your site. I mean, you're even doing it kind of in the in the sort of redevelopment of the mixed use neighborhood to the south, um, where you're creating these sorts of anchors on the corners. Um, and so if you can just speak to that a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think um, very early on, one of the first kind of design moves was exploding that corner. And the corners were really kind of the active place, even walking through the neighborhood, that's where people kind of met and where little corner stores might happen. Uh, so I think that was kind of a tactic for there. But then uh, reaching up towards the north, I, I agree with your comment that maybe that placement of the auditorium could have been uh, in a way that doesn't impact kind of the, the sight lines and the circulation going there. Uh, I think I kind of wrestle between school security, but also having everything open and visible. And so that northern side, uh, there's currently a community garden there 
Mm -hmm. uh, so I just kind of saw it as an opportunity for the students to look out at that place. But I, you're right, I could have thought more about moving between those two places and not just mm -hmm. looking at it. Well, like I'm looking at the, the floor plan and I'm seeing kind of like two moments of entry. So that your new stoop and sort of this existing cutout on the southwest corner. Where is the primary entry? Like when a kid is getting dropped off by mom or dad, like who's dropping them off? Like where, where are they getting dropped off? Because um, then I'm just wondering in terms of this, sort of, you have two different entry points, right? One of which is like this super strong presence with all these like steps and like sort of this big plateau on top. Um, Cause that's going directly into the library. And so is one sort of like the weekend entry access versus the other one is the, the weekday. How does that work? Yeah, yeah. So I thought of the kind of porch entrance, that would be the main school entrance, especially for the younger children who are kind of on this floor that faces the courtyard. There's also an entrance kind of from the courtyard. So you can make, there's almost like a Z formation here of the two entrances on that floor. Then the second floor, the stoop entrance, uh, would be more of the community entrance or for the older students that are here on the second floor, kind of linking into that more community facing building. Uh, uh, Melanie, I think also to, to Dana's point, they didn't have to be literal cut throughs. Like if, 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 if you had slid stuff over and, and maybe made a glass link through the auditorium where you, where you continue the visual axis, but that also gives you another gating point of, of all the things I learned working with Dean Andrews on the Henderson Hopkins School. He, he had had a farm in Ohio and he told us about the way they managed the fields with gates, right? And that, you know, you close one gate, you open another one and that's where the cows go. And, and when you bring a pub, it, what it does is it creates the ability and you and I talked about this a lot. So many schools claim to be community, open to the community, but it's only after the school is closed when it's convenient for them. And by creating additional gating options, you can create controlled access for the community. You know, in, in communities like this, they need places to have community meetings, to have politicians come in and talk to them, to have, um, you know, uh, 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 learn about things and, and, and to be able to have those gating options where they don't just happen, you know, at the time you need to be feeding your kids, you know, it's like to be able to open that up and create that access is super important. And I, I see you, you're trying to get there and it's, it's super subtle. Like it, you know, it, it, it takes a, a lot of work and you're attacking so many things here that you, there's no way to be expected to, to hit them all. Um, and, and I also just wanted to, uh, to build on, um, it's more of a question, and, and I love that you are thinking about bringing in this community, more community programming, because what makes pedestrian space safe is actually the pedestrians and not the space, like getting people on the street. And, um, but in bringing that in, one of my favorite memories of these neighborhoods are, is the Arab culture. And, you know, the it, talk about making something beautiful out of necessity, you know, the, the bringing of fresh food into the neighborhood on a horse cart. It is a West Baltimore tradition and, and specifically, and it's just hanging on. And I wonder if that's something you, uh, not to put one more idea in your thesis, but, but I just, it's one of my favorite memories. And I just wonder if you had thought about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think definitely food growth is a, a big thing that uh, I wanted to include. Uh, and I know there's there's currently a 4-H club in the neighborhood, which I thought was maybe only a rural thing, but it's active and there are uh, community members out there who grow food. Uh, so I think one, having the green roof and the kind of orchard area in the courtyard was kind of pushed towards that. And two, I was hoping that the kitchen and the kind of food pantry uh, programming might also uh, maybe start some kind of program where they start to buy extra food that community members might produce uh, and maybe even use it in the school lunches that the children receive. So uh, this is partly programming, <laughs> partly uh, the actual physical edition, uh, but yeah. Hey, this is Emma. Oh, go ahead, Emma. Sorry. Go ahead, Emma. Oh, sorry. Hi, Melanie. Um, this is um, listening to everybody's um, input. It's definitely a project that gets um, people around all excited because it, it feels like a, a great seat that um, 
ignite a lot of great ideas. Um, I like all the uh, breakdowns and I do see on the right side um, how the school connects to the park um, is a great idea. I think connectivity is always um, to public spaces is always something uh, really important to um, soothe um, any kind of um, in trouble community because often um, I don't live in US that often anymore, but I've been to Baltimore before. I think um, the feel that you are in um, the city is how the block is structured um, being quite fortified. So if any of the program behind these facades have any potential challenge, it definitely affect the, the feel, um, how you walk through these streets. So I see a great potential that you bring the Green Boulevard on the east side and a little bit on the west side of the school. But the school is a public function and it will be um, great, you know, if the time allows that you can take more exploration that um, how the school connects to the park because, um, you know, they all have public function and they have the um, museum, which could well being organized together into the park house, but um, it seems currently um, the residential block, if I read correctly, the mixed use. And so it, it visually has the opportunity on the east side, but how about um, the rest? If they can have more exposure linking the two and with thesis, obviously you can also be a little bit more brave and, you know, really poking out the, um, the constraints and taking a little bit further, maybe even challenge the code a little bit because something of an action being done over here could bring a much more value to enhance the community. And with the school and the park become the activator that penetrates into the surrounding neighborhood and how the connecti connectivity start to establish because it's a urban, it's a project that trying to solve urban challenges. So how does this project, once the site is established and what are the points this particular site connect to activate the city like the acupuncture points. So it's not only activate alone. And I want to hear um, how about how the link with the rest of the point. Yeah, yeah. I think. I hope I'm clear. I know I said. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no problem. Uh, I'm just writing down kind of the comments. Uh, so I think kind of looking towards, as you said, acupuncture points and seeing how the school and the transformation can connect to maybe existing infrastructure that's currently in the neighborhood. Uh, unfortunately, I should have had maybe a wider range of the site plan, but just nearby, there is kind of a youth center and a fire station along West Lafayette Street. And if you go further to the east, there is the Lafayette Square Park, uh, which is kind of a walks away from Harlem Square Park and contains all the churches that kind of ring that park uh, and really activate it, especially on Sundays. So I see maybe the, the school transformation and kind of this uh, new infrastructure coming in as also linking over to that park. Maybe I could have made it more intentional by pulling some of this street park out and starting to link it over to that square, I think would have been uh, a really nice poetic move uh, that I didn't have the chance to, but yeah, hopefully that kind of answers what you're saying. Yes, thank um, you. Great, so um, uh, a terrific uh, round of, of uh, comments and, and insights in the part of the jury. So before we hand it over to your chair, uh, Melanie, are there any uh, summary comments that, that any members of the jury would like to make uh, before we hand it over to Peter Noonan? I, uh, I, I, you can only attack so many things in the thesis. I'd love to continue the conversation and, and talk about the school's program as well. You know, just, um, I, I, I think one of the, the way people get held back is um, 
through history and these schools and the relationship to the neighborhood, but also the notion that there is a way to learn and um, recognizing that there are a lot of ways to learn and providing spaces that allow everybody to find the way that they learn best um, is really, really important to every community, but particular communities that are, um, that are falling behind. And that's, it's a whole nother hour conversation. Yeah, I hope maybe someday we have a chance to have it. <laughs> Terrific. I'll offer one summary comment, Melanie. Um, first of all, I, I agree. I, you tackled a lot in, in this. And so um, kudos for, for you know, a great job trying to address all of these issues. Um, I think given a more time, you know, you could have delved down into a lot more. Um, one comment I would make is that your most aggressive move is that is that wing, adding that wing to the north. So really you mentioned kind of um, expanding the footprint to to analyze what actually what what is the context to the north that that's cut off, uh, and how 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 you are engaging um, with that part of the community. So I I would say um, you know if you would take this to the next level, it might be great to do some simple diagrams to understand um, how how the different profiles of people are moving through uh, the broader uh, context of. Of, uh, of the neighborhood and through your building and how they access it, um, what is entry. And I think that would then um, help inform um, your over to the right with your perspective, some of your material choices and, and expressions of the stoop and the porch and probably help simplify those a bit. But great job overall. And thank you for presenting today. Terrific. Uh, Great. Um, so I think uh, I think with that um, we will uh, turn it over to uh, Professor Peter Noonan for uh, some some final remarks as uh, Melanie's uh, chair. Great. Thank you. Thank you, James, and thank you, um, guest and uh, reviewers, and uh, thank you especially Melanie. Um, it's been a real pleasure uh, and treat working with you over the last two years realized through several courses. And um, it's, it's just so, um, it's, a, it's, it's such a pleasure to see your project and, and your thesis. I think, you know, to qualify Zena's last comment, the, um, the, the most kind of powerful move at the scale of the block in the building was that North Wing. But what, what struck me about Melanie's work over the year is that she um, took on this project at, at the scale of our, our history, our, the city, um, the neighborhood, uh, the block, the building, and the pieces of the buildings, the porches and the um, classrooms. And, and so her, her ability to kind of work at all of those scales and realize um, Again, the the um, you know the difficult past and the hopeful future is what made um, serving on this committee such a pleasure. So we're looking for great things from you in the future, and you've certainly done a great thing here with this project. Thank you so much. Terrific. Great job, Melanie. Congratulations, Melanie. It's been great working with you. Looking forward to the next uh, step in your. Uh, career. Terrific. Okay. Um, uh, we're going to, uh, we're going to uh, queue up our next um, candidate. Uh, the venue uh, will remain um, uh, Baltimore and uh, looking forward to your presentation, Chris. Over to you. Good morning. Thank you all for being here. My name is Chris and my thesis project is called Crab Attack and Cuisine, Blue Crab Restaurant and Educational Water Treatment Wetlands at Sparrows Point, Maryland. Before we begin, I would like to thank my thesis chair, Iana Vandergoot, and committee members, Lindsay May and Michelle Lamprakos for guiding me through this journey. So the Chesapeake Bay is an important home for me, but also its other inhabitants. 
I'd like to share with you today a design proposal for a unique crab tat restaurant situated in a water treatment wetlands where people can visit and learn more about the blue crab and other marine life that populates the Chesapeake Bay. The story of this thesis begins with the blue crab, Calnectia sepidus, also known as the beautiful swimmer, is one of the many residents of the Chesapeake Bay. The blue crab is our neighbor and also the state of Maryland's mascot. It is a delicacy and cuisine a source of recreation, an important part of the Chesapeake Bay ecosystems. Balancing the blue crab's population is integrally connected to balancing the health of the bay. However, its journey to becoming a full-fledged blue crab is not an easy one. In the context of the Chesapeake Bay, the blue crab spawns from the orange molt that the female blue crab bears. Once hatched, the larva is then swept away by water to the mouth of the bay. Only 2% of the 700,000 to 2 million larvae make it back to the bay to continue to the final life cycle phases of megalops and immature blue crab. Along the way, it leaves submerged aquatic vegetation to shield itself from various predators, including other blue crabs. However, submerged aquatic vegetation is not able to be grown consistently due to high pollution levels in the Chesapeake Bay. Nitrogen, phosphorus, and sedimentation are the primary pollutants of the bay. While they naturally occur in the environment, there is an overabundance of them in the bay due to conventional agriculture. Pollution from urban centers are also major contributors to dead zones in the center of the bay. There is no oxygen in a dead zone, therefore little to no life can exist, including that of the blue crab and the vegetation it relies upon. The blue crab populations are affected by pollution, overcrabbing, and illegal crab. During 2000 and 2008, there was a massive loss in submerged aquatic vegetation due to pollution, resulting in the blue crab population diminishing to its lowest points. This resulted in the loss of jobs for fishermen all over the bay since other aquatic populations struggled too. While the blue crab population has risen, it is currently below average. It is also the most important catch for Maryland in terms of market demand and cost. Catching the blue crabs is an exciting recreational activity, but when the waters are clean and the crabs are healthy, eating the crab becomes an immersive experience. The restaurant and educational wetness program on this thesis project is inspired by the experience of eating amazing local cuisine and learning to respect the environment that is their habitat by engaging it directly as part of the eating experience. Food is culture. While local seafood chains are clustered around the Baltimore Harbor and Maryland, these are outnumbered by the fast food chains spread throughout Baltimore City and County. Raising the number of local seafood restaurants in Baltimore County would be beneficial for the spread of holistic seafood culture, which leads us to our site, Sparrows Point. Sparrows Point, located at the edge of Baltimore County, was a shipyard and is currently a heavy polluted brownfield site that is adjacent to a dead zone in the local waters. Shipbuilders in this area were historically transferred from company to company until eventually their work was outsourced to foreign companies, resulting in the loss of their jobs and the abandonment of the site. This thesis reclaims the brownfield site in an effort to educate the public on the harms done by industries and urban development that pollutes the water and soils. The remnants of the tip of the site show roads and building paths among polluted soils. There are also topographic mounds that rise up to and be higher than the overall site. The site can be broken down to four zones, and the prime view of Fort Carroll Oyster Sanctuary is to the west and is a beacon of environmental restoration. Taking care of the environment is crucial for life to exist, and educational lessons need to resonate deeply with the public so that an understanding of the intricacies of complex systems are developed. While surface level understanding of don't pollute exists, Having a deeper connection will support more impactful lessons. This thesis envisions a person's need to eat and enhances it beyond a simple need into a broader understanding of the connected programs of wetland vegetation, wastewater treatment, and the crab habitat or crabitat that humans have engaged for ages to raise crabs and release them back into the bay to later be harvested and eaten. As part of this design proposal, a water treatment plant is situated at the center of the site in order to connect its outfall waters with the existing mound landscape. The southern regions of the site are restored into a wetlands ecosystem. The wetlands feature a crab habitat that uses a portion of the water treatment water flow and is housed within a unique crab restaurant. 
The restaurant looks out to Fort Carroll and makes visible the clean water being sent back to the bay. The prevailing winds on the site move from northwest to southeast. The restaurant and wetlands are positioned so that the restaurant is not downwind from any foul smelling air that might come from the wetlands. The final phase is the wetlands channel clear water south to the area of the restaurant. The site design is handled as a phase sequence over time. Phase one includes marking the site with an isolated crab habitat to provide a potent opportunity for learning about brownfield sites. The brownfield soils are filled with heavy metals and petroleum byproducts, so a permeable layer of clay is used to isolate the crab habitat from pollutants. The lesson comes from the need to clearly separate the crab habitat from the environment. Maritime forests, wetland vegetations, and willow trees are planted in phase one to try to remediate the soil over time. In phase two, the trees are harvested at natural mineral precipitation calcite and atmospheric carbon from the polluted soils and concrete demolition debris are harvested as well. These materials become the construction materials for future buildings on site. On phase three, a wastewater treatment plant, water wetland system, and Kravitat restaurant are constructed. Phase one marks the site. Here's an axonometric of the first phase Kravitat experience. The inspiration from this Kravitat comes from the final phase of water pools from the Blue Crab Hatchery from the University of Southern Mississippi. Phase two integrates a wetland system and expands the path system. Willow is then cleared for building materials. Phase three clears the smaller plants for the continuing system of wetlands and also gathers calcite to use as a building material. The Beijing Olympic Park wetland system that contains three zones, the wetlands, oxidation pond, and eco zone was used as a precedent for the water treatment wetlands in this design proposal. Wetland plants offers a finishing clean of the water and process bacteria and pathogens minimizing the need for harmful sanitizing chemicals. The outflow of the wetlands is located where the public can experience the water and the environment. Phase four integrates the rest of the wetland system as well as constructs the restaurant. Phase five finally integrates the water treatment plant as well as the outgoing water to the restaurant. This diagram provides a sense of scale. The site does seem big, but in fact, it is easily walkable within a quarter mile radius. The site pathways are also zoned to offer three types of experiences. The experience of visiting the site to hold the meat, going to the site to study and research the wastewater treatment wetland system, or to make a day trip and combine both of the activities. Here is what it is like to experience the habitat as well as a bridge that connects the mound system up in the wastewater wetlands. This view depicts one of the wastewater treatment wetlands mounds. This view shows access to a trail along the oxidation pond in the treatment wetlands. Finally, these views show the wetlands as they near the restaurant. And on the right is a scenic service road that loops the edge of Sparrow's Point. The wetlands culminate with a restaurant that has a filter for both water and people and highlight the final outflow of the site before reaching the edge of the bay. The primary building materials used are ferrock, a stronger replacement for concrete that uses iron dust, crushed glass, and CO2 for a stronger form of concrete that does not contaminate when coming into contact with water. Willow is then used for the facade and main spaces. Lime wash is used for a finish to continue the site into the building. And finally, CLT panels are used for the roof and walls and glue and beams and columns for the structure. My inspiration comes from the understanding of space in relation to being above or in water. Tato Ando and Muda Architects display spaces above water, which are the top row and the bottom left. VTN Architects and Tyler Aragonis display spaces in the water, which are the middle and bottom right. In the restaurant, my goal was to create both types of experiences. The main entrance to the Kravitat restaurant is on the east. The entry bridges float over the water and bring visitors in from the wetlands. Upon entering the building, 
Visitors pass by a glass kitchen and find themselves in a room with a pool of water at its center and a seashell-like material on the pool. An open window of the sky is surrounded by a canopy of intricately woven little poles. Visitors can observe crabs moving in the crabitat as well as guests harvesting their own dinner. Water flows through the crabitat into the submergible dining room with views of the bay and beyond. Visitors can gather at these terraces in the dining rooms to eat and celebrate the clean water as it flows out to the bay. Avid learners can go to the do-it-yourself kitchen from one of the crab attacks to learn about cooking the crab. From the dining terraces, visitors can exit through the sliding glass doors to the water's edge. As one approaches the building, the will of facade in the summer will go and become synonymous with the growing cycle of the crab. The sinuous striations created by the careful weaving of the willow on the elevations is inspired by the same natural structural forms that appear at a microscopic level in the crab shell chitin. As one enters the building, they can either order food or rest by the crabitat pool for a smaller cafe experience. When it rains, water will fall from the sky and increase the water level, reducing the space of the crabitat. During the summer when the water level is low, people can rest on the steps by the wall. While the steps descend into the water, the woven level above steps up, signifying the layers of both the oyster and the crab shell. The elevations are representative of the crab chitin helix structure where it starts off on the left corner and eventually wraps up to the right. It thickens and bends to be more and less protective of its interior spaces. In the submergible dining room, people can eat on a series of platforms that recall the base materials found in soils and seashells, iron and calcium in the form of ferroc lime-based concrete when the water level is low. Now, when the water levels are higher, the water can flood the steps in between the dining halls while people enjoy the shelter of the cozy willow canopy above. To conclude, the goal of this thesis was to design immersive experiences and architectural spaces that are deeply embedded in a unique landscape with remediation infrastructures that help to heal the industrialized sites and failing ecosystems. It is my hope that this approach to architecture can inspire humans to care for their food sources and the environments that support them. Thank you for listening. The floor is now open for questions and comments. Uh, terrific. Thank you, Chris. Um, you have already posted the link to your uh, mural in the chat, and that's visible there. So you're going to share my screen too. Uh, share screen and orient us briefly on your live mural. So I guess I don't know where to go first. I can, uh, I'll jump right in because uh, I, I found this project really interesting. Um, I think my, my initial questions were um, just so I can understand the architecture a little bit more. Um, and, and maybe you said this and maybe I just, I just missed it uh, while I was taking notes. Um, how is, um, how does the, how does the, the, the building actually sit on the landscape again? Like is, so you're, you're sort of hovering over the landscape and allowing everything to sort of flow underneath. Is that, is that correct? Correct. So okay. well, the water flows through, I don't know if you see my screen right now, mm -hmm. uh, through the yeah. middle portion and yeah. then out into the bay. Got it. So these are all like piers or something mm -hmm. or, okay. Yeah. Just maybe show your wall section that might help right. answer that question. I, I'm also just wanting to suggest to the group to look at the mural board because the images and the renderings and the video were really low resolution. There's a lot of really beautiful line work in the interior perspectives that definitely shouldn't be missed. Gotcha. Okay, yeah, I see it. Um, and then also, again, for, for clarification, so I, the, you talked a lot about materiality, mm -hmm. um, and it sounded like you're, there's this sort of feedback loop you're creating or trying to establish between 
the existing site and the building materials? Are all the building materials sort of a, a byproduct of the, the site process, the site mending process? Everything except the mass timber. Except, except the mass timber, okay. I thought you said the trees were being cut down and then reused, or did I misinterpret that? They are. Uh, that was for the willow. Um, so that was going to be used for the facade of the interior. Got it. Okay. Understood. Got it. Yeah. So I'll, 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 I have, I have more comments, but I want to let others a comment, but I, um, you know, I, I sort of attached myself to the building and the floor plan. I, I'm really glad you showed those images of uh, the elevations, uh, which I'm looking at in your mirror board now. Um, Cause I actually think those are more befitting to the actual site, you know, in terms of just organic and I'm, I'm talking pure aesthetics here. I think the, there, there, there is potentially an opportunity to create and, and really align yourself with this idea of sort of this immersive um, experience with this really organic site um, by possibly loosening up the floor plan a little bit. Um, you know, it, just the, the, the floor plan I'm sort of looking at just kind of seems rigid. It kind of seems um, um, a little squarey, a little boxy. I, I appreciate the facade. I think that's more befitting to this sort of site, but I, I think I think maybe a different or a slightly, yeah, slightly different organization of the sort of programmatic components that, that really sort of stretch out into the site in different ways. Um, it's sort of befitting what you're trying to do um, because, you know, you do have this sort of really organic landscape. You know, it's kind of different from what we, we typically try to do in urban context, which is sort of keep to the edges. And here you have this sort of, you know, open landscape that I think the architecture could respond in terms of a floor plan standpoint, could respond a little bit more to um, sort of how you're doing with this, with this sort of willow rendered uh, material facade um, um, uh, interpretation that that you're showing um so i'll i'll, I'll leave i'll leave it there um and i'll if, if there's time i'll come back with some more comments but but overall i think the the, the analysis and the site work that you're doing I, th I think is quite quite nice and and the pattern of sort of reestablishing a natural environment i thought that came through really clearly um i think the architecture uh could just use another in terms of a floor plan standpoint, you use another pass in terms of really embracing this sort of immersive uh, uh, experience that you're trying to create. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Yeah, just to, to build on that, um, as, uh, I'm trying to understand the relationship between the main restaurant, which has this quite organic wrapper and mm -hmm. the pavilions that come out. And I wonder, I, I understand the because you, you have such a kind of ecological touch and you put so much thought into it. I, I completely understand the, the decision with go to go to CLT, but even in your your boards about the CLT, you know, you can make organic, you know, you can do glue lamb beams that allow you to actually build the organic shapes that you're suggesting in the facades um, rather than build using the plank boxes and then and then shaping over it. And if you could just talk about the decision to do it that way, and then the, the relationship between the dining pavilions and the main building, they just, they almost seem a little like traditional, like hair, you know, the, like the Harrison's restaurant on the dock out in Tillman Island kind of thing. And I'm just trying to understand the relationship between the main building and those. So the first, all right, let me just repeat your, first question is to make sure I know what you're asking. So the first question is why uh, the, just the rigidity of the building? Well, you, you chose to use the CLT plank system for your main mm -hmm. construction, right? Right. Which by its nature is rectilinear, but mm -hmm. then you clad it in an organic facade. And I'm wondering why you didn't just build it with glue lamb beams so where the building could have had more of it could have reflected its facade in its construction. So for that, I, it was, I guess, just the appeal and I guess how I had set up the structural grid. Um, and I guess from a previous pass, I was actually, I can show the process. I was 
way too literal and like with like the organicness of the building mm -hmm. so okay. that's why i was trying to step back and make something that is a much more like comprehensible and digestible space for people to experience so that is why i you know i went back to having a more square space mm -hmm. um and to you use CLT rather than the glue land beams over that. I think Chris, there were also some, you, you had also done some really, and I don't know if they're on the board here, but you've done some great case study explorations of um, mid-Atlantic vernacular uh, buildings connected to fishing and hasher, hasheries, spring houses. Um, and there was a kind of utility to those buildings that I think was inspirational for you for the floor plan and how the water moves through these fairly pared down, um, you know, buildings. Um, so I know you had you had done some really nice studies of that, and I'm just remembering that as maybe the moment when the the plan pivoted to this sort of hybrid between the organic form and the really utilitarian um, structure. So while well, the buildings themselves are not on this board, um, I guess is like the combination between, I guess a fish or trout, well, fish house where it's basically a roof in the ground and has running water uh, that goes through it as well as a levier, which is like a French wash house where um, water is running through the space. So I guess this was, I don't know if you see my screen, but this was the first, like, I guess, exploration within the site of allowing it to continue through. But then also, uh, upon my research, when I realized that the oyster was a natural filter for the bay and the notion of spitting water, clean water back out into the bay, I decided to come up with that oyster form while allowing water and the rest of the program to fit around it. Mm -hmm. One thing with oyster filtration and just water filtration in general, though, is that it can be a really smelly process. Right. Um, and so what I'm noticing is like when you're coming on site, I assume you go into this parking lot and then you're walking past the water treatment facility and you're walking past all these wetlands to get to the restaurant. Right. Um, and I'm just wondering if you were cognizant of that. Like it, it's, it's very, very pungent of a smell. Um, and so that's, that's kind of one concern I was, I was thinking as I was looking through this, as, as well as like a lot of times when people are visiting restaurants, it's at night for dinner. Mm -hmm. uh, how, is, how is light going to uh, kind of integrate with this sort of sighting? Because you have a lot of natural habitats, many of which don't like uh, like really high luminosities of light um, and could be even more disruptive to the, the, the animals and the habitat. Um, and then my last comment is really just kind of looking at flood risk. Um, you are in the bay. Had you looked at any stormwater maps to see like what your flood risk is like? Because you really are bringing water through the building, into the building, through the roof. Um, it's laying on top of the water. Um, I'm just wondering if there's there's a risk of actually having this this being so integrated into the water in the bay that, you know, you get a 100 year storm and unfortunately your entire building gets kind of wiped into the bay. Right. So uh i guess the first question was smell so i guess the most important thing in terms of smell was getting the crab attack um kind of i guess uh positioned in, away from or away from the winds of the wetlands so the primary winds come from uh northwest to southeast and so uh that was to avoid like the smell from the winds as for the stench from the water, um, you know, it's this, I, I was mainly focused on the celebration of clean water going out. So the smell of that particular moment, uh, you know, it, it might be a little smelly and maybe more so when it floods, uh, if you're uh, on the outside, but like if you're on the inside, you probably won't, you know, smell it and then the second question was uh the lighting um in terms of that i was 
I really did not consider that as part of the project. If anything, I was only going to make it be like the most direct route to, from the parking to the restaurant, just to minimize the impact it ha could have on the, um, the rest of the um, habitats and other parts of the wetlands. And then for the flooding, the, uh, so I, I researched, I guess the general rule, it was like eight feet is the 100 year floodplain. So uh, that's basically, I guess, in the topographic map, it, it's just, it's basically this edge. And so it's like just right out of it. Okay. Bruce, what, what, what is the, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Uh, what, 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 what is the approach like? Um, like, so if I'm, I'm parking in this, in this parking lot area and I have to walk, is there a preferred path? Like, how, how do I approach this restaurant as a, as a patron? I think you had a diagram, but I can't find it about. Yeah, this. I left that diagram out. So I could, uh, it is basically you either want to just go straight to eat, you either want to learn about the water treatment plant and the wetland system, or you want to learn about everything. So if you wanted to just go to eat, you would go from the parking, cut through the middle, walk along the oxidation pond and crab habitat to the restaurant. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to do just the water treatment plant, you'd kind of go to the water treatment plant, then up and then to the wetlands. And then finally, if you want to do everything, you would go to the water treatment and then go entirely through the wetlands and all the rest of the systems and then basically north wrapping around to south and then back to the restaurant yeah so it's, um oh mark no, go, ahead. You were go, ahead. No, go, go ahead. ahead you go um, ahead the the the, the, the quick follow-up to that is I, I guess i'm wondering you know if i am a if i am somebody coming to you know specifically for the restaurant, you know, it just seems like a very arduous path, somewhat, you know, I, I would say un, somewhat uncurated in terms of, you know, how I get there. Um, and I wonder if, if you ever thought about sort of breaking up, because you do have these sort of separate buildings that have these separate uses, but I wonder if there was more thought given to, you know, the sort of quality of the approach to the restaurant space um, as, you know, a sequence of spaces throughout the site. Um, maybe sort of breaking up the restaurant sequence into a set of pavilions that you sort of go through that, you know, again, offer additional shelter on this long path to get to the restaurant, um, but also just sort of, you know, break up, break up this sort of path and this approach that, you know, I, I think, I think would probably need some, some wayfinding way spaces or whatever, but I think you could do it, we'll do it with architecture. And it's really craft the sequence of how you get from, you know, the arrival point to, to, to the restaurant that's sort of out in the bay. Um, um, I think, I think that, that could be a useful tool to kind of tie some of these, tie this building back to the site a little bit. Right, so I guess I kind of realized uh, the circulation uh, when I was trying to put in a loading road. And while I was trying to put in the loading road kind of through the site, um, it, well, the loading road itself would have been more disruptive, but then that's when I also kind of realized, uh, you know, the path itself might be a little bit too long, but I was mainly focused on getting the landscape uh, set in stone before the restaurant in terms of marking the site and uh, learning about it. So that's why I, I didn't consider uh, breaking up the restaurant into multiple pieces along the way. Sure, yeah, I think there's, there's plenty of ways that you could approach that. I'm not saying that breaking it up into pavilions is the answer, but I, I think like you've done such a great job of, you know, reclaiming the, the, the area for the landscape. And I, I think Dana brings up a, a great question about, you know, you know, uh, existing floodplain, but I do think some sort of curation to how you actually approach um, some, some sort of curation through the site 
could could be very beneficial. And, and maybe that does lead to sort of breaking up the mass a little bit or, you know, smaller pavilions as you approach the, the, the main restaurant space where the majority of people are going to end up and want to, you know, sit and enjoy the, the space that you've created, right? So I think just having that sequence from point A to point B, um, you know, maybe with some some stops in between um, could, could be quite beneficial. Because you, you got a lot of landscape to work with and they don't have to be serious buildings. They could be, be just really nice, you know, pavilions that, you know, offer something, you know, tied to the crab attack. I love that word, by the way, uh, tied to the crab attack sort of culture that you're creating. I also like the word Crabitat too. That that was um, definitely got our attention. So thanks, Chris. Um, Chris, my comments are: um, I love the way you set this up. A lot of thought and um, a lot of research, and it was it was really you know from your video a very you know um, very thoughtful, even poetic entree in, into this project. And so you you really just start getting excited the more you talk about the ecology of this place. Um, and, and how that can inform uh, the design. Um, and I'll, I'll start with, with the fact of the journey. This is actually gonna pick, off, pick up of where Mark, Mark's, uh, Marquis' comments left off. Um, it is, you are inviting visitors and, and, and uh, into an, um, an immersive place, a very sort of hollowed, sacred, wonderful um, place. So I do believe you have to think about what, um, Marquis said about this uh, uh, curated experience, or or um, you know immersive how how you how you curate that experience. It's not just about walking from parking, then deciding to get to go to either to the restaurant or or sign says go this way. Here's the water treatment, but really thinking about what happens along the way because there are some there's some large kind of blank spaces, you know that that are gonna be just dead zones um, along this journey. So you really need to think about activating that and making this um, as beautiful uh, and poetic for the, the person that parks their car and walks there as, as your entry was. I also wanna um, comment about how, how then that, once you get to the restaurant, how that informs your your form. I love, you know, um, the certain things, you know, cabin. Of course, the crab habitat is great, and I really like the way you you thought about the way the crab habitat steps steps down, particularly when it when the uh, water level is low, um, as a counterpoint to the roof that that you know sort of peels back and and um, almost like the layers of the shell. So that is really cool. I think it's over here. This, this kind of image to the the oyster interior oyster day image. Um, so, so that's beautiful. You've thought about independently some really great places and moves, but I wanna go back to comments that I heard from some of the jurors earlier. I, I do believe that um, the language of, of, the, um, of the building and the, and the geometry, um, you know, and you know, it is, is not, uh, could be more consistent with with the with the internal expression and the poetics of what you of what you started here, um, if we look at the bird's eye view that you have, um, you know the there are some wonderful moves. Like I said, with with the crab attack and the opening, um, the um, clear opening to the sky. I do think the the um, willows more as an applique could have been something that more integrated into the form. And I, I appreciate you explaining your earlier explorations, which were probably too organic and a little limiting, but I think might've veered too much on the, on the, um, you know, the, the sort of uh, traditional formal forms and, and using the, the willow then as an applique. I think thinking of, of, of something that can integrate a whole lot better consistent with the way that, that uh, the site is doing and your the way you described it um, would be uh, something that you could explore better. Also the way the building really touches this hollowed place, the way it lands, it, 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 it touches the ground. I think more thought needs to be given there. It doesn't want to look like something that kind of landed there, right? It wants to look like something that that sort of like everything else naturally evolved and explored. So I think 
<clears throat> some of your earlier sketches um, were provocative and intriguing, I think maybe there could be a balance between those earlier ideas and, and where you ended up um, in terms of the, the, the physical expression of the building. But um, overall, I really appreciate the, the level of thought that went into it and that you, you, you are, um, I love it when, when you take um, risk, which, which you have, and uh, you know, in, in actually just selecting this site anyway is a bold move and a risk um, with all of the, the ecological challenges that, and climactic challenges that uh, you know, you've heard us talk about. And I, and I think, um, so I, I commend you for, for uh, you know, choosing such a high bar challenge. Yeah, just to build on that, Chris, I think the the forms, you know, I, now, I mean, when I saw the sectionals perspective, I immediately thought of the Tillman Island Dock restaurant, you know, the old Harrison's, you know, which was a screened in porch on a dock. So I understand it. But I think part of the problem is you're merging these things. What's beautiful about those buildings is the juxtaposition on the, on the landscape. And right now you're pulling them a little too close together and diluting both of them. And, 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 and I think it could be really poignant. You let the landscape be the landscape, even if the landscape is a building at one point and the vernacular be the vernacular and sit on it. The other thing that's great about that dock restaurant porch is it goes over the water and you brought the water sort of in, and this goes back to the conversation about flooding and break, like I, you, you kind of stopped at just one point to far away, right? Recognize that the water's going to come in and flood that, you know, that the places that you eat rise out of the water, the water comes in. People want to eat on the water, in the water, over the water, right? And let it happen. You're kind of letting the water come in and thinking about that you can control it, embrace the fact that you can't, right? Let these be docks. Let those pavilions be what you wanted them to be. And, and you'll be there. You know what I mean? Like, just you got to pull it back apart and get to what to what your your influence was and and let it you know let it exist as what it wants to be the other thing i wanted to talk about is the, the curated path which i totally agree with but i don't think it's a curated path right when you think about the program of this place you, you're 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 building this beautiful example of the way things should work and where your food comes from and its relationship to the environment and what you have to think about is there's not one type of person who comes here, right? So you have grandparents bringing their kids here and what, or their grandkids here, and what's the path that they go on? You have a school bus with a teacher coming here and what's the path they go on and what do they see? You have a couple coming here for a date night. What's the path they go on and what do they see, right? And then you have, it's a restaurant. So you have somebody coming here for a party or a wedding and what's their, how did they get from the parking lot to the restaurant as fast as they possibly can, right? The, like, you're not making this for a person, you're making this for a lot of people who use it in different ways. And you have the ability not to have a curated path, but six, you know, a bunch of curated paths that once they intersect, give you an infinite number of curated paths that every time you come back with a different group, you can do it in a different way. And that, that's sort of, programmatically what you have to embrace here. Like there's a user here who wants to see the wastewater treatment plant, right? Like there's a user who that's an educational experience. And, and so like curating those paths and those programmatic experiences is I think, you know, it's not one, it's not getting your distilled. It's, it's really understanding what do I, when I park and I do the wetlands loop, what do I get out of it, right? And what are the stops along the way? How do I get shade comfort, covered and comfort along the way, right? Those are the things that is the next layer uh, of, of, this, of this thesis. I think Ben too broad. Okay, I can go, go ahead, Diane. Uh, sorry, I was gonna say, I think Vince is actually bringing me to think about like what are sort of the loops in, in this project and what are the sort of distances that you've created? Cause you've created a lot of path. And so I can also imagine that this has a recreational element as well for people who wanna jog or bike, um, you know, or just walk. Um, and so it'd be really kind of cool if you could 
it lay out a little bit more of the user experience and, and literally give us like, well, there's a 12 mile path where you could literally train for a half marathon on this site. Or if somebody is with a wheelchair or is pushing kids, like, this is the shortest path to get to like the, the, the million dollar view into the restaurant. Um, I, I think that there's a lot of potential to create other uses on this site that you may not have even intended for. Um, and I think that's really exciting, um, especially just like this idea of just being able to, to that you could go use like your Nike app on your Apple watch and you may, like enter in, I wanna, I wanna come to the Krabitat and I wanna do the three mile loop or the five mile loop. And I think there's, there's just so much fabric in, in those trails that you've created that I think there's a lot of opportunity for that. Yeah. Hi, Chris, this is Emma. Um, I think, uh, you know, this project gets me really excited because it's trying to first approach making um, an impossible side to be possible. So it brings a lot of different opportunities. So it has, um, you know, uh, the, the park, the wetlands, um, um, the craptation, the eco zone. Um, on the way you're saying it as a listener, I really, as an individual, I start to um, picture how each site looks like. So I was thinking one approach to do that is like all everybody has mentioned so far um, on the experiential design, because uh, like Brian said, it meant for multiple purpose. And how does um, defining, um, after you make this whole site uh, workable and defining the viewpoint and how each view um, creating different kind of experiential uh, approach for different group of people. So they can come like the Beijing Olympic Park. People doesn't have to come, just uh, don't have to come for just one purpose. And they also can come for multiple times. And what are the modern means of um, park in one place and using different kind of media to approach to different points on the site, like jogging is one, and maybe is the park providing um, checking bikes, like bike you can uh, using mobile device and really enjoy it. And at the end, you know, really picking up the restaurant, how um, each individual dining in the restaurant can understand the expensive view um, that's surrounded by. I think those are all the opportunities that you can uh, take on and defining it. And ultimately it brings layers of approach, not just one single from, um, from the macro uh, approach to final decision, because it's just a constellation of star of activity happening on the site. And we really want people to um, really enjoy and explore. Thank you. It's really nice approach, yeah. Especially the first part. Um, Bide, do you have your, your hand up there or? Hey Chris, how are you? Can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you. Hey, Chris. Great project. Um, it's very lyrical and poetic, as uh, some of the um, jurors mentioned. I think that there are, you know, some almost ex existential question that I was going to ask about the form of the building. You know, why you chose that particular form? Because, you know, as people were saying, I love that that title, the Krabitat, right? You're sort of coming here and learning the complete uh, sort of from cradle to grave uh, life of a crab, right? Where you see, you go through all these various hatcheries and whatnot, but yet I'm going inside a crab to eat a crab. There's something about that, that, um, that I'm kind of, I'm, I'm kind of wondering how you arrived at that. Cause the thought that comes to mind is like trying to feed a hamburger to a cow kind of thing. There's something about that, that I was wondering how you sort of arrived at that, that form to go into and dine and eat crabs. Um, second thing, uh, and, and hopefully you can answer these in succession. The second thing has to do with just basic planning principles inside the building with regards to how restaurants work. You know, the, you have these great pavilions on the water. That's amazing, right? People are sitting in there dining. 
but getting from the kitchen to those, uh, you know, pavilions could be an issue, right? As people are sort of going through the main spaces, I'm crossing over with tables of trays, you know, to sort of serve people in those dining uh, pavilions. Um, and I don't know how to solve that in this case. It might, you know, you don't want to split the kitchen, obviously, into two. But I think there's some minor programmatic and, and plan layout issues here. Outside of the fact of something that somebody mentioned earlier about the amorph amorphous form of the shell, you know, how could it have been, uh, how could the interior have taken part in that sort of like sinuous and uh, interesting form on the outside? Um, the last thing is also something to think about. You know, you mentioned the submergible dining room and also the habitat, which I think is very, evocative in your interior renderings, but something to be cognizant and, and, and be careful about when you're planning a dining experience is people go to restaurants and they drink alcohol and all it takes is a, is a, is a glass of wine and they're falling over these steps and falling into these shallow pools and drowning, therefore lawsuits, right? So, you know, I think curating that experience and in, 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 you know, completely curating it, how people move around these spaces, how you guide them through these spaces, having them learn about, you know, the crabs without, you know, noting your, your restaurant as the place where we go, where grandma broke her hip last summer, you know, kind of thing. So just, just things that I, I think is a fantastic project, but these are just little kernels that sort of the bells are sort of going up in the back of my mind. Obviously it's a thesis. If you had, you know, a year as a real project to design this, obviously some of these issues would be resolved. Uh, but primarily I was hoping you can comment on the first question, this sort of existential part of, of going inside a crab to eat crabs. So I guess to answer that question, um, I, I guess, so my, I, I wanted to let also some crabs like try to go out to the bay, but also crabs are cannibalistic by nature. I don't know if you caught on to that during the presentation, but they do tend to eat each other, which I know is a little dark, but. Chris, I think Mire's question was more about it, it, the, the larger conversation in architecture about also building as icon, right? Is this mm -hmm. building going to literally become the crab because it's inspired by cra the crab? And, you know, that goes back to conversations about like Venturi Scott Brown and, you know, um, examples of architecture that are, are quite literal icons. So I think Mide is getting at that question and whether you see yourself in that camp or whether you see yourself being inspired by more subtle things like the, the, the cleaning process, the filtering process of the oyster or the microscopic kind of pattern, structural pattern of the chitin, which you, you tried to repeat with the willow, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's maybe more Mide's question. So maybe you can speak to that a little bit and what your thoughts were. Okay, so when the question's oriented like that, so I, it, it was the combination of just learning the individual ecological aspects and then trying to put them in, uh, put them together in a way to, um, not only for people to experience, but also trying to build a sort of relation between the crab and the oyster because one eats the other. I, I think in your case, the word that you need uh, is biomimicry. Mm -hmm. Like you're not, you're not creating a crab. You're, you're using the crab and you're using the oyster to inform the, the form and the materiality and sort of the, uh, sort of the ethos of the space in itself. Um, yeah, and I, I would just to ask you to like go look up biomimicry and just like how that has employed itself in different buildings in recent years. Um, but I think what's happening, at least in, in for my opinion, in the actual architecture is you have like moments of biomimicry and then very sort of rigid, traditional minded, relatively traditional forms and, and, and structuring that you're using. And so I, I feel like you're in conflict with one another. Like it's, 
I'm not sure, it doesn't quite feel like the biomimic moments are uh, enveloping your sort of traditional moments. And I feel like I just, I feel like you either could just go a little bit further so that they're, they are more obviously in conflict with one another or either kind of go in one way or the other. It kind of feels like they're, they're working in together, but not, they're not in conversation with one another necessarily. Just, just a small point on Mita's point about the planning and there's so much bigger issues here. I wasn't going to bring it, but my first job was steaming crabs in Baltimore. And, you know, and, and when you're dealing with seafood, you're dealing with something that's alive until you cook it mm -hmm. and it's wet and cold and smelly, the back of house, and it has to be next to the kitchen. You can't cross any public space between the back of house and the kitchen. Uh, I, I was the whole time I worked there, I wasn't allowed to work, to bring my shoes that I wore to work into the house. I had to leave them on the front porch when I got home, just to give you an idea of what it's like in a seafood kitchen. <laughs> right. Vince, Vince, we knew you were a uh, connoisseur of the of the uh, crab consumption and cooking cooking process. We can unpack yeah. that more. Um, we have time for uh, maybe a, another faculty. Uh, comment and then we need to transition to uh to our chair and final remarks so julie you have your hand up and uh uh please uh, uh thanks uh, i'm in sorry go ahead julie sorry uh i'm enjoying the um this conversation very much uh i think it's great when a project um uh you know elicits this this kind of back and forth and all of these sort of thoughts and ideas. And I just wanted to um, just comment that I, I really appreciate the um, the process sketches across the bottom, and uh, they really they just show this sort of thoughtful search for um, for what is the form and the expression for a project like this that is that is inherently derived from this idea, the narrative, the vision of the integration of the built form with environmental. Um, not not just the uh, environment itself, but the process, the function, and and not something that's like I'm going to go uh, put in uh, bamboo flooring from Asia. Um, this is something that is a lifelong quest, uh, I think, uh, for any architect who's interested in the this sort of repair, not just of industrial sites, but the repair of sort of humanity's relationship with the living world. So. Uh, I just want to say, Chris, you've sort of, um, you've definitely sort of mapped out a, a career for yourself. Uh, so the fact that you didn't, you know, solve it this time is uh, really, um, it's a testament to how big a vision you're working with. Um, and, and that's what we want to see in a thesis. So I just want to congratulate you. Great. Um, I, yeah. Thanks. Like as my final comment, second that yep. it's obvious where your passion and your study and you're like where you started this and you dug in and, and really tried to understand the big questions. And I would, you know, we may have some quibbles about your form and some pro, but that's to build, like, it's so obvious what you, what you dug into here. And I think what you were trying to get, you got, and the architect, you know, the programming and architecture will all come, you know, I mean, you obviously have the skills, um, when I did my thesis, I never even got to the architecture. I wrote a small book because I just was so enthralled with the problem. I never got to the form. So, <laughs> I mean, the problem you dug into is important. And I, I really love all the effort that you put into, in, into framing the issue here. Uh, terrific, terrific, uh, Vince, thanks. Um, yeah, I, so, I so, just- uh, one, one last thing, again, yeah, Chris, yeah. I, 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 Julie, thanks for pointing us to the bottom. Uh, with those lovely sketches that you've done there. Um, and then looking at them, I just was like, oh, wow, there it is. You know, the question I asked earlier, you know, I, I wish you had framed this as, you know, almost like nature reclaiming, uh, you know, it's like man over nature, but nature over man, where the crab is sort of claiming its agency. Therefore, your form of this crab-like shape enveloping this sort of man-made sort of construct, right? I think that could, there's some poetry in that, you know, that sort of ties back to your original, original ethos. I think, you know, these sketches are amazing. So Julie, thanks for pointing us to that. I, I missed that. Great job, Chris. Yeah, indeed. Um, a terrific uh, job, Chris, um, a subject very near and dear to our hearts here in the, in the Chesapeake region. 
I just wanted to throw out one, uh, one, one uh, uh, comment. Um, I, I wonder in the strategy whether the Crabitat doesn't envelop the building rather than the building enveloping Crabitat. I, 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 think, I think you could create a, a complete zone into which this, this building is inserted that actually is the Crabitat. And I, I Mide, your, your question, um, your question, and I, I sort of frame it in, in emotional terms, your question about going into a pavilion where you see all these beautiful crabs and then, okay, you're, you're gonna eat those, those crabs, the immediacy of that. I wonder whether if, if, if the crab attack enveloped the building, there might be, uh, for lack of better words, some professional distance between, between those two types of activities. But anyway, um, we need to, uh, we need to uh, transition. It's been a wonderful conversation. And now we need to hand it over to uh, Professor Jana Vandergoot uh, to deliver some final remarks. Great. Well, what a wonderful, inspiring conversation. I'm, I'm, I'm loving the thoughts and the way that people dug into some of the key questions in this thesis, you know, the existential question about, you know, what, what's the inside outside relationship? How far does the architecture go in terms of, um, biomimicry and, and picking up on the themes of the landscape. So um, I loved you know, hearing what the critics had to say about that. And I think um, lots of really helpful comments. I also appreciated um, you know, the more detailed comments about how does this building touch the ground? What about CLT and, and its potential for geometry and um, life cycle and material that could be grown on the site? Appreciated the comments about the different loops and the pathways, you know, being choreographed as their own thing, um, you know, potential for pavilions to help the spatial sequence. Um, and I'll just kind of wrap up by saying, Chris, it was wonderful to explore these questions with you um, and just see how every week you came to our meetings with at least 20 sketches. I mean, Chris really had to edit down <laughs> what he showed in the process sketches on the bottom, but he, more than any student I've worked with, explored every you know, option, every, every possible extreme for the building form um, and, and was asking these questions all along you know, uh, what should it be? And I imagine that you'll continue that exploration like a few of the um, jurors mentioned, like that, you know, these, these questions maybe don't get answered in a thesis project, but you, you continue answering them and you continue the conversation with others, right? Um, how do other people feel? Um, so that, that's wonderful, um, you know, that, that your process and your iteration in, um, inspired the conversation. I think the last thing that I'll say, and, and this is, this, you know, I, I got thinking about this through this project is that, um, and it was one of the last comments that came up, the, the, kind of, the kind of violence of going to a wetland and, um, you know, viewing the crab and restoring the habitat and then eating the crab, catching the crab, maybe even killing the crab and eating the crab. Um, and there, there's been some really great writing on that that topic in connection to you know, fish or seafood and other animals. And um, one of the things that I had read was, was that in some ways, the, the catching of the crab and eating of the crab and coming face to face with that is better than um, sort of the disconnect, right? The, the feeling of, of just being neutral or not connected. Um, and, you know, it makes us more alive, right? It makes us more aware of the reality. And so I appreciate that what Chris is proposing for the primary program here is that people who come to visit the site really face that, you know, when they, when they eat this kind of food, when they enjoy it, what, what is the whole story of that, you know? And then, and then are they comfortable with it? You know, and if they're not, then they should stop eating crab. But if they are, and if they find a place for themselves, then at least they know the process and can support, you know, healthy a healthy life for those animals. Um, 
Yeah, and I, I, I think the biomimicry conversation too is it, 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 Chris, for you, I think it could be a lifelong exploration and it would be exciting to, you know, track your career and see what you, what you do and how you um, make waves in that conversation for the discipline. So um, I'll, I'll leave it at that and just say, Chris, it was really wonderful working with you and being inspired by how productive you've been. So thanks so much and congratulations. Thank you. It was Terrific. a pleasure working with you and thank you all for the great comments. Congratulations, Chris. Um, terrific, terrific project. Um, we um, are going to, we, because this is a four hour uh, stretch of four projects, um, we typically take a short uh, intermission uh, for about 10 minutes. Um, so if, if we could uh, reconvene at 1040, uh, give everybody a little bit of an opportunity to, to get up and stretch and, and, and bask in the afterglow of, of the crab conversation. And then we'll uh, we'll come back at we'll come back at ten forty. All right. So see everybody uh, in in a few minutes.
Welcome back, everybody. Okay. All right. Um, looks like we're mostly back. Give it another 37 seconds. Okay, we got all our jury here. <clears throat> Just want to be sure Zena and Emma are up. I'm back. I'm starting my camera in just a second. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So uh, we'll go ahead with uh, Zuzana. Um, presenting our final two uh, presenters, the Zuzana. Zuzana. Good morning, my name is Zuzana. Thank you so much for joining me today for my thesis presentation. Before I begin, I would like to thank my committee and my chair, Professor Brian Kelly, and my mentor, Scott Rawlings, for your support and guidance throughout the whole process and also my friends and family. I would like to present to you, Architecture Improving Mental Health. New thinking in hospital campus design focuses on health and wellness, building on a growing database of evidence-based research that links physical environment to more successful healing practices. Evidence now fully supports the measurable benefits of treating mind, body, and soul for the best outcomes. So healthcare has finally become truly holistic if you're a patient. But do you know what is the most stressful profession in America? The healthcare giver. Even before the pandemic, these people work 30 hour shifts without seeing any daylight at all and experience very challenging emotional situations that take measurable physical toll on our medical staff. During the pandemic, many of them reported fear, insomnia, and developed depressive symptoms after seeing their patients and colleagues dying and getting sick every day. Evidence has shown that happier, healthier caregivers directly correlate to better patient outcomes. Every major hospital campus should provide a center for restorative health for their staff because they deserve it. In my thesis, I'm developing a prototypical center that provides the staff with the support they need to ensure that they maintain a strong mind, body, and soul. My goals are to achieve tranquility through biophilic design, evoke a multi-sensory experience, and create three levels of comfort. For my site, I chose the largest private hospital in DC, MedStar Washington Hospital. It is located near Howard University and about 5.3 miles from the capital. On the existing hospital campus, it is very difficult to find your way. It lacks any vegetation and is very overwhelmed by these massive buildings that don't let a lot of daylight to the interior. However, on the other side of the Children's National Hospital building, there is a beautiful view towards the Macmillan Reservoir and Howard University. So to fix those issues in the campus, I developed a new master plan where the main entrance becomes a green inviting boulevard. 
And the orthogonal street grid makes it easy to navigate. And the narrow shape of the buildings bring more daylight to the interior. I also added a new entrance for ambulances to shorten their trip from the city to the emergency room. The site for restorative center in this master plan is located in southwest corner of the campus. It has meditative character thanks to the presence of water, the McMillan Reservoir, and is also located further away from all the noise and busy environment of the hospital. It gives an opportunity to create a tranquil surrounding. In my design, I want to address the axes created in the new master plan and have these two zones. The first one more public, more open, improving human connection, which is so important in the healing process. And the second one more intimate, more private for medical workers who seek psychological help and don't want everyone around to know about it. The site plan shows that the park is accessible only from two sites for safety, from the hospital campus and from the city. There are also a few openings in the vegetation that frame the view towards the reservoir. I also added another water feature in the lowering of the topography where Michigan Avenue previously went to enhance that contemplative atmosphere and create a stronger edge between the two zones and to create a multi-sensory experience involving the sound of calming waves of water. The main axis is addressed through these two buildings, creating a threshold between the stressful hospital environment and the more calming um, oasis for contemplation. The axis ends with the meditation pavilion above the water, and from which we can notice another major cross axis that directs us towards the counseling center. As I mentioned earlier, there are two zones. The first one more public with an axial formal garden surrounded by water. And the second one, a picturesque garden with an organic organization of paths and more dense and taller vegetation. The journey begins with the open plaza extended towards the Macmillan Reservoir, where a lot of people are going to pass through, moving from one hospital building to another, or going to one of the cafes located in the ground floor of these hospital buildings. This plaza ends with a sitting area from which we can observe the park. So it is like a, like a preview of what the journey is going to be like. Next, we enter the first zone with the recreation center. The building has a solid front to enhance that edge, the threshold between stressful and calm environment and create a moment of suspense and a transparent, lightly structured back open to the garden. We enter the building from the back to the open lobby from which we can go to the changing rooms or to the smoothie bar located in the bottom building. The solid front part contains all the service areas, the restrooms, staff rooms, storage, staircases, and an elevator. The front facade is a solid concrete wall and partially reveals the wooden structure of the back of the building. And the section shows the transparent curtain wall that helps the in to connect the interior with the garden. The two buildings are connected through the bridge on the second floor. And the second floor has, um, the, the top building is meant for the louder workout, so it has an open gym area. And the bottom building is meant for more quiet, calmer workout like yoga and Pilates. This view shows how we enter the park with the trees at the front helping to achieve that axial organization and the bridge connecting the two buildings and framing the view towards the meditation pavilion above the water. As we move closer to the pavilion, we get to another bridge, which helps to evoke that multi-sensory experience through changes of materials. The gravel path along formal row of evergreen trees switches to the wooden boards of the bridge and then changes into soft grass surrounding the pavilion. 
The pavilion can also be observed from the other side of the water. If we enter the park from the city side, we can also see the bridge connecting the two zones and the Children's National Hospital in the back. And the bridge is deliberately not located on the cross axis to force people to slow down as they move through the park. So they have to turn around and find their way to cross the water. After crossing the bridge, we enter the second zone and the forest gets more dense and mysterious. The winding paths lead to secret rooms spread around the park. One of them is on the hillside with a small pond here, changing into a gentle waterfall and then further leading to the temporary exhibition gallery for people to display their artwork created in the therapy. The cross axis, beginning at the meditation pavilion, continues in the second zone through the stairs leading to the counseling center, which is located on the other side of the hill. As we go up the stairs, we can only see the solid concrete wall, again, creating that moment of suspense by not yet revealing the beautiful view of the reservoir. And if we look at this side from again, the counseling center is located here at the southern edge of the park. It is formed with four simple blocks connected with each other and forming a courtyard in the center to give visitors the sense of community and make that medical worker feel like they're not alone with their problems, that there are others who struggle with the same issues and they are here for support. As we, went, as we enter, we walk in the indoor-outdoor area with, with seating and restrooms. And as we move forward, we enter the courtyard from which visitors can go to rooms for individual or group therapy sessions. And at the south end of the courtyard, there's an outdoor contemplation space on an elevated podium with a view of the Macmillan Reservoir. The elevation drawing shows that the building is made entirely out of sustainable concrete for a minimalistic, not distracting design. The section cut through the courtyard shows the elevated podium and the repetitive pattern of the concrete columns. There is another water feature at the edges of the courtyard to enhance that meditative character of the space. In the middle, there is a Japanese healing garden with designed gathering spaces. There is also another entry to the courtyard through this ramp from the park. And the vegetation helps to frame the view towards the reservoir from the counseling center, from the counseling rooms and towards the sculpture in between the trees, which helps to erase that edge between the built and the natural environment. This is that outlook towards the sculpture reflected in the small pool with columns framing the view. The connection between the natural and built environment can also be seen very well in this waiting indoor-outdoor area, which is using the concept of biophilic design. The perforated concrete wall funnels indirect light and helps to create that calming, tranquil atmosphere. The room on the left is another waiting area that can be closed with this pivoting glass door, so it can become a one big room or two smaller ones. Through a horizontal slit in the concrete roof, the interior is provided with natural and direct lighting. The outdoor concrete courtyard is creating this church-like divine feeling, but as we enter the counseling rooms, the atmosphere changes, it becomes more cozy, through the changes of material. The use of wood on the floors help to create that warm, safe space. And this view shows the experience in the courtyard. The repetitive patterns of the concrete, minimalistic columns is encouraging contemplation and peacefulness. The visitor's view is directed towards the natural environment and the Macmillan Reservoir. The open indoor-outdoor areas and lack of enclosed corridors eliminates the risk of acquiring hospital transmitted diseases. Also, the rainwater from the roof is collected 
and cascaded down the sculpted spout to the designed water feature. Lastly, there is a children's pavilion located by the Children's National Hospital. As we enter, on our right there is a children's cloakroom with their restroom, and on our left there is a transparent flexible play area connected to the garden. The floor pattern extends from the interior to the outdoors garden, and the trees are reflecting the column grid. The big open lawn provides a space for children to safely play and spend their time outside. And at the end corner, there is a staff room with separate restroom. So the building uses the same design language as the other buildings in the garden. The front is a solid concrete wall with restrooms and other service areas. And the back is a transparent wooden structure that extends to the garden. And here is a view showing that connection of natural and built environment and blending indoors and outdoors through a curtain wall and extended wooden overhang. In the garden, I'm using different types of trees. The threshold is extended by poplar trees. Behind this open space, there is an organized grid of hornbeam trees, which are easy to trim and shape. The edge of this, of this island, in the threshold to the meditation pavilion, is marked by evergreen cedar trees, partially revealing the beautiful view of the water and the pavilion. The picturesque garden consists of a combination of trees, some of them being divine maple trees, beautifully changing its colors throughout the seasons, and the American elm. The row of trees by the Children's, National, Children's Pavilion is made out of Norway maple trees. Unfortunately, we'll ne we will never be able to undo all the trauma and pain that the COVID-19 pandemic has caused for our medical staff. We can give them a space that enhances tranquility, that provides natural lighting and incorporates nature in the design. It is a place that makes them feel appreciated and a place that they deserve. With that, I'd like to open the floor for questions and comments. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Zizana. Thank you, and I'm pasting the mural in the chat. There you go. Thank you. And I'm also going to share my screen to show the mural. Okay. Right. Come here, baby. You are so good. Okay, great. Very good. So looking forward to uh, our dialogue um, about your project, Susanna. Is anybody having trouble joining the mural? No? Is it just me? Okay. Just checking. I'll try oh, I again. Am as, I am as well. It just let me in like two okay. seconds ago. Yep. I'll try again. I just had to make an account quickly. Okay. Yeah, it seems to be loading okay, at least for me. There we go. Great. So did everybody get access to it? Because I can resend the link or I can yes, invite. Yeah. Okay. Oh, we got it. Susanna, just to clarify, the, the, in, the main intended user is the healthcare workers at the hospital center? Yes. 
And, and then for the children's pavilion? Um, it's for the children from the Children's National Hospital. Okay. Well, I, I, I'll, I'll dive right in and I think probably state the obvious. I, I think there is a, a really nice gracefulness um, to the entire project and the and the, the penmanship and the craftsmanship of your vignettes, uh, especially I think are really beautiful. Um, you know, there there's for me there there initially there were some uh, supposedly uh, similarities between, you know, in terms of a site selection between Chris's project and yours, but I think. What's, what's a little different for me here is the, the way you're able to maneuver and frame these different moments um, as one departs from, from, the, from the hospital uh, part of the campus. Uh, I think you, really, you do a really good job at moving us through the site and showing us you know look backs, look forwards, change in topography to help frame a shot. I think, I think the way that you you're able to maneuver and manipulate the site is 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 really quite graceful and, and it comes through in, in your um uh, in, in all of your drawings actually um my my question um the the part that stuck out for me at least was this this threshold um uh this initial threshold that you move through the first zone the more public zone at the top um just curious about the, I think you alluded to it a little bit, but wanted, hopefully you can talk about it a little bit more about your decision-making uh, choices there, but just wanted to talk a little bit more about, you know, the, the, the materiality choices and um, that you sort of chose to sort of create this threshold. I get the mass part, but wondering about the, you know, the sort of, you know, blank, almost like brutalist sort of Choice and and I and I don't mean it in a in a derogatory way, but you know just sort of characterizing the architecture, you know, sort of brutalist concrete architecture, um, as the sort of surface that you sort of approach as you as you uh, as you approach this part of the campus, from from the hospital, the main hospital. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yes, like like you said, the uh, I wanted to have this solid blank wall. Um, right at the front, at the very beginning of the garden, to um, to create that edge between this um, these two different environments, the busy environment and the tranquil tranquility of the park. And um, I used concrete for that solid wall um, because um, I think I also wanted to connect that part with the counseling center, and I used concrete over there for this. Um, the um to create that like church like temple um divine feeling and also um i was really inspired by ando's architecture so that's mm. kind of what i wanted to know. sure sure yeah i think um I, I think i think that's totally fine i think a, another probably in addition to your your site plan drawing i think is because because there 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 is two parts to this campus that you're creating there's this new revamp master plan that you have um you know which i think you know on a on a basic standpoint is is fine because you're re reestablishing these edges and and creating some connectivity there but i think what i'd like to see is you know especially in your your intervention site plan is, you know, what that connection is between the rest of the campus and and the entry point of the threshold, right? You, you sort of just have this sort of hard start, uh, you know, with, with this sort of line of evergreens. And, you know, sure, that's that's the threshold, right? But there's there's a sort of approach that that you sort of lead up into that and sort of how, and sort of how that ties into this boulevard piece that you've created. So. So I think you've got the pieces there, but I think, you know, um, sort of showing that in the detail that I think that will require, um, you know, would, would sort of be a, a necessary addition to, to the sort of site plan uh, that you've created. Um, uh, or, or again, which I, I, I think is quite nicely, nicely done. And then the la last thing I'll say is I think another vignette 
because you talked about it in your analysis was this sort of look back at sort of um, Howard University um, um, in sort of the con contextual analysis. I think a vignette from like the top of, you know, from the, from the mountaintop would have, would have been a really nice sort of vignette to sort of add, you know, creating this sort of uh, relationship, uh, visual relationship between this sort of dense forested landscape and the the um, and alluding to the urban environment that you're in, um, you know, with you know with these sort of markers, these sort of uh, markers in the landscape that are in the distance, but but again showing that you know there's this sort of respite you're creating um, in the context of an urban environment. I, I think um, uh, would have been a nice sort of vignette to show, sort of the reverse of this sort of middle one that you have where you're walking up the ramp to the um, to the counseling center. I, I think it is right. Um, I think that would have been a nice thing yet to show, but um, I'll, I'll stop there and I have some other comments, but I'll, I'll let others talk. But I, overall, I think uh, the drawings are, are really quite elegant. I love the looseness, but the um, uh, this, this sort of finite um, gracefulness of, of the vignettes, especially are, are my favorites. They, they really make you feel like you're in the space, um, uh, even though they aren't, you know, sort of polished computer rendered uh, uh, images. I think these are these are really nice. Thank you. Um, Susanna, could you do one thing? Just uh, uh, I know everybody has independent access to the mural, but could you click out of the outline on the right there so you make your common image just? Oh as yeah, as of course. Great. And you can make that bigger. No, terrific. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, I would love to applaud you for your graphic quality. I think it's pretty impeccable. Um, you've done a really great job in representing both um, by hand and then also with sort of digital representation. Um, I just, I'm, I think that it's a really cohesive story from start to finish. And I think your graphics really help do, to convey that. Um, one thing I'm, this is nitpicky because I think you've done such a great job, but one nitpicky thing is I'm looking at your, your proposed master plan and uh, for one, you're missing your, your intervention, your main intervention in that drawing. But the other thing I'm noticing <laughs> um, is that you have cut off the Southern road around the hospital above the, the reservoir, which um, from my time in DC that I've spent there, I know that that road is a really primary artery in the city, connecting people from um, like from Howard's campus across uh, Northeast. And it's almost like a highway. Uh, I also know from that area that, that those roads are quite loud because of the sirens. And so I'm wondering, because your intervention is kind of this sort of interior, exterior thing, you are going to have a lot of noise. There are a ton of traffic. There's the sirens. How are you, is there any way that you're modulating sound in this environment? Are you pumping in white noise? Like, how would you deal with being in the middle of the city, um, but at the same time, this very, like, Japanese classicist, intervention? Yeah, I think, um, so looking at the master plan, um, I think, you know, you, you, we can't really prevent um, all the noise pollution in, in this area from all these buildings, but um, that's why all these buildings here in the south are extended um, towards this part and, um, well, one for light, of course, but also for, um, um, to, to extend it to this part where where is like less of this traffic and noise um, since this is a little calmer area than um, in the north. And um, also you mentioned this, um, the Michigan Avenue that I moved, right? Yeah, so um, I didn't get rid of it completely. I just moved it to the edge of the reservoir. So the access is still here. It's just, um, it goes around. <laughs> I just in terms of reality, and I, I know this is it's a sucky moment when you're an architect and you're like, I want to just do whatever I want. But if you look at like what Michigan Ave, like the traffic flow of what Michigan Ave really holds, it's a ton of traffic. And so your, your little very elegant, winding, sinuous road isn't going to handle it. Um, so just when you go into the professional world, just know that like traffic is something you really do have to confront. Um, and yeah, yeah, I completely, I'm sorry, I'm, I completely agree, and I, I just, um, when I was thinking about it, I think I was thinking about it more for, like, 2050, 
Um, so like way in the future. And I, I know, I, I don't know if this is like very realistic, but I really hope that um, cities will become more walkable and we will not rely this much on cars. So it will not be as busy as it is right now. Yeah, I mean, another thing in terms of like just getting the traffic to, to deal with it right now, you are creating a pretty rigorous grid on your site. And so perhaps one thing is just to extend those streets out of the site and that way people have choices and they're not just going around the northern end or the sort of the sinuous sort of scenic route that they actually can come through. Um, and then that way it also kind of creates a more walkable environment to get into the site as like if you're a neighborhood person and you know your kid's sick you don't have to kind of like take the long route to get in you can just kind of go through the streets that are closest to you. Susanna, the, um, so I, I also agree the, the formal aspects. It's funny, you mentioned Ando. I was, I was thinking more Renzo Piano in the Manila collection or the, the extension to the Kimball. And of course, both, both Renzo and, and Ando were both trying to outdo each other for Khan's greatest disciple, right? So, you know, it, it's got really some, some aspects of that in it as well. I, I, I wanted to ask you though about just the, the premise of your thesis and the idea of a precinct for these people versus embedding it, you know, the idea of, of the health care workers having a crisis, like, like this is a place you have to plan and take time and go to versus, um, you know, I, I need a moment to step out. And can, can you just talk about your, your, I mean, you very clearly decided to make a precinct, right, a place to get away from it all. And I just wanted to know if, if, if you could talk about that in, initial decision a little bit. Um, you mean the initial decision to dedicate it to medical workers? No, to make a, uh, an isolated precinct versus some kind of an embedded um, oh. intervention. You know, to, 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 pull, to pull their moment, their place to have a moment to themselves out of the hospital. I mean, it's still in the campus, but it's really out of the hospital versus trying to deal with it within the hospital. Yeah, I had different iterations um, just for the master plan itself. I, I was thinking of creating that oasis like right in the middle in the center and um, that would create easier access for all the workers from the hospital buildings to, to that park. But then I decided that, first of all, I want this, this Part to be kind of a prototype that all healthcare campuses can use. Um, so that can, um, I, I really wanted it to, to, res to, um, to respond to the context as well. So I, I want to show how, for example, water features are important in the, in the process in creating that park. So I, I added my own, but I also wanted to use the, um, the one that's existing, the Macmillan Reservoir. So that's one of the reasons why I decided to move it to the southwest corner of the campus and not put it in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, and also, um, yeah, like for um, access, easier access is one thing, but I also wanted it to be more on the side so it's, it's just calmer and um, more peaceful. And also, um, I added a lot of vegetation to the master plan, so the journey really starts, um, it can start even from that, that green main entrance, the boulevard, and um, people walking to that park is, it's already, they're already in that process of, um, you know, calming down. Hi, Susanna, this is, this is Zena. Um, <clears throat> Uh, great presentation. I echo what everyone else says about graphically, and you clearly have a beautiful hand for drawing and um, graphic presentation. Um, but beyond that, just, just the way that you've presented your work, which I appreciated, I love the way that you kind of walk, took such care and, and, and were very particular about walking us through um, your, your entire thought process, process and your scheme supported by not just your words, but um, plan 2D diagrams and, and these little vignette perspectives are just amazing. So thank you um, for that. Um, so I have 
a, a, uh, a couple of comments. Um, one is more, more overall, just dealing with the sequence. And I wanna make sure first that I understood what you're saying because I was looking at this sequence from recreation to, to, to counsel, I'm sorry, from recreation to meditation, the counseling to the children's area. Um, and you sort of describe the counseling, which I center, which I see as really the, the largest um, <clears throat> um, kind of insertion here as you wanted to keep it. I think you said something about, you wanted to keep it kind of um, nestled and, and more private so that there's sensitivity to medical workers who need counseling. Um, is that counseling center also, was it intent to make it accessible from this road as well. Um, and, and the reason why I ask is because, you know, um, I see, I certainly see, you know, recreation and, and children's kind of family noisy areas together. And I also see um, the meditation and counseling kind of going together, but they're, they're, they're kind of four things um, spread it across the site, really intentionally being, being deliberate and separate from each other. So um, I, it was, I was curious to know your thoughts about why there wasn't more of a, maybe a campus feel to them in a sense. Um, and, and was it because you just prioritize privacy or privacy, um, particularly for the counseling center above all of that? So that's one question. I'll, I'll uh, make a couple of other comments and then you can um, respond. Um, I love the way that you, used, um, you exercise restraint. <laughs> I love restraint, by the way, with designers, because there's always, you know, that's a hard thing to do to have discipline. But I think in your, in your um, simple material collections, I love the clean concrete wall. I think there's one elevation over here, the east, uh, yeah, this east elevation. I mean, th there's some things that can be improved a little bit with scale, but if you just, back, you know, look at it, holistically, it's wonderful to see the contrast of these really pure forms against this natural setting. Um, and you're just, you're just really using three materials all the way out, the concrete, the glass, and on the um, recreation center, the, I think that's the only place that has wood, which is, which is here, the butterfly kind of roof. So I did want to just um, applaud you for you really using Simplicity of, of material, simplicity of forms in this sort of um, or, organic um, uh, setting. So, so that was uh, that was my question and my comments. If you can answer the question, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, um, thank you, thank you so much for your comments. And yeah, I I just I really love um, minimalism and um, you know not using too many materials. So yeah. Um, and to answer your question, um, no, there is no accessibility on from that road um, from Michigan Avenue um, right at the edge of the reservoir. Um, there is an opening in the vegetation for the view, well, three openings, but it's not meant to be accessible. Um, the, there is one ramp that goes here um, but there's also no um, connection uh, on this side. The, the, this opening is also just for the for the view. So um, um, this there is also if you um, maybe I can zoom in. If you look at the topography, there is it's um, there's it's pretty steep over here. So it will also be not very comfortable to to walk up here. Um, and yeah, accessibility was a, a big part of our discussion during, during our meetings um, with my committee and my chair throughout the semester, so. Okay, um, so I think I, my, larger, my larger question was, were you trying, so you were intentionally trying to keep these as four isolated experiences and not necessarily have any type of formal relationship other than the winding trails that connect them, but you really wanted them as discrete, less, more of these four isolated events um, maybe we, we can argue that between the meditation pavilion and the recreation center, there's a relationship. But for the most part, there it, it's three or four discrete experiences as opposed to a connected campus feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, 
when you're when you're at the meditation pavilion, that's when you when you notice the counseling center through that axis. Um, this is this view here. You you see these stairs. So when you're standing over here, um, then you notice these stairs and that view towards that. So that that's when you notice like, oh, there's something going on over there. Let me look. Let me check it out. <laughs> but um, from other places in the park, no. It's pretty isolated. Um, we have a raised hand uh, from the faculty, um, Peter Noonan. Great, thank you, um, Jamie and Zuzana. This is a um, beautifully drawn thesis. I really want to commend the um, your your presentation style. You know, the word restraint was used, um, but there's also kind of a a nice command of different drawing types. That that big perspective on the far left is very evocative. And then you're using, um, you know, you, you label your central drawing a site plan, but it's really a um, an oblique, you know, elevation oblique. Um, and so it's just, um, I just wanted to commend that, 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 that the drawings are reinforcing what you're trying to get through in the thesis. And then the other thing I'd, I'd like to say is it seems like in all of the different um, pavilions and places you've designed, there's, there seems to be a preoccupation with this relationship between uh, the built, built um, form, vegetation and landscape and water. But in each of them, they're, they're explored in a different way. Sometimes the water is, is within the, the architecture. Sometimes the vegetation is outboard. Sometimes the architecture is embedded in the water. So I, I really, I'm just trying to um, you know, absorb all of that. And I, I think it's interesting to look at your project through that lens, that, that the relationship between those three different uh, ways of experiencing the world are explored in very different ways in each of the um, kind of three moments of the project. So nice, nice job. Thank you. Thank you so much. Susanna, have you ever been to Fort Worth? Fort Worth, Texas? No, no. <laughs> you should really go. <laughs> <laughs> the, the things that you're exploring here, because there's the Kimball, the Renzo Piano addition to the Kimball and the, and the uh, Fort Worth Museum of Art, Patado Hondo, all within a couple hundred feet of each other. Um, and there are three explorations of these materials and these ideas in different hands in different times in their careers that uh, taken as a whole is a, is a really wonderful architectural experience. I think, I think you would very much enjoy. <laughs> Terrific. Sounds interesting. Once the COVID is over, I'm going. <laughs> um, we have a uh, uh, another raised hand, uh, uh, Douglas. Yeah, I, I agree that this is a really beautiful project. Um, but I, one thing that I think can't be understated enough is how necessary this this program is at this particular campus. Um, currently, there is not any sort of outdoor space that is made for healthcare workers um, at Children's National or, or MedStar. Um, there is an outdoor roof deck that was done as a pro bono project by Perkins and Will a few years ago. Uh, this is called the Children's Garden. It is specifically and only for children and their families, which has been uh, excellent to have. But healthcare workers are actually not allowed to, to use that space because it's supposed to be a, a private and protected space for, for children, which is a great piece of program to have, but um, as a spouse as someone who works there day in and day out, um, there's just nowhere to go that's outdoors. There's no daylight, there's no outdoor space of any kind. Um, so I, I think it's just a fantastic uh, uh, thing to be looking at. One comment, well, the, I think it, that's maybe, I think it was maybe mentioned, um, maybe the proximity of this to the hospital. Um, and uh, while I think that the overall intent here is uh, one worth pursuing and having this sort of large uh, garden and sort of forest um, that maybe could be done in sort of a, a longer break period, the realities of uh, healthcare, the, 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 how fast paced it is and when these sort of um, mental uh, concerns can pop up, how rapidly they can, uh, I think it's really important to have 
outdoor spaces that are immediately adjacent to the separate departments that are part of the building that are outdoor spaces similar to the existing children's garden. Um, because the, the urgency of needing to be able to remove masks and papers and be outdoors and, and breathe air quickly um, and then be able to unfortunately get back to work as fast as possible is, is a real thing. And um, being able to leave the hospital, let alone go downstairs to even get food is something that most doctors and nurses will say they can't do on a regular basis. Um, so while I think that it's great to have all this, I think we also need additional interventions that are happening uh, closer to where they're working. Um, but overall, I think this is a really, really nice uh, thing to be thinking about um, in, in a great intervention on the site. Great. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. The, oh, uh, Vince? I was just going to say that was exactly the genesis of my question, and I don't think it's either or. I would love to see one more piece of this, which is like a kind of typical small scale uh, version of this that's that intermediate time when you need a moment, when you can't get all the way over here, I think would just be, it would be the ribbon on the project that would tie it all together in terms of your initial, what you're trying to accomplish and what you're doing kind of formally. Great. Um, we have time for uh, another, another comment on me day. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, sorry, I'm outdoors, so please forgive me. But um, it's not an excellent project. I, you know, I made a comment in the chat session there that, I, you know, I want to sort of live in your sketches. Like, they're just so evocative. You wish real life actually is like that sometimes just to kind of temper humanity. Um, but also starting a couple of things, starting at your master plan and then sort of zooming in. I actually, in conjunction with the comment that was just made with regards to outdoor spaces that you've created uh, for the addition to the wings that I'm seeing in your hospital. I actually think it's, it's very evocative and very nice as well. You know, in hospital design, especially in, in the West, we tend to design these very big buildings without much care for the occupants, the people that are working in it. Um, but you will notice if you look at Germany and you look at some of the new hospitals that they're creating, they actually mandate that whoever's in uh, a hospital has to be able to see outside, no matter where they are in the building. So it tends to lend to almost like a Swiss cheese kind of building where there's gardens and holes and spaces of reprieve. But it works quite well for the benefit of the occupants. And I see these very finger-like buildings that you're creating with these courtyards within them, I think actually is in, in alignment with your general ethos of your thesis. And I think I appreciate that very well. Um, moving on to the first pavilions that you see, that's sort of like thresholds. Uh, I would love to hear your comments on the form, the butterfly roof that you actually have. Because when you look at it formally, it looks as if it's opening towards the hospital just by the form, of, the form of the butterfly, the sort of longer wing versus the shorter wing of that butterfly roof, which in a sense is kind of indicating a thrust towards the hospital as opposed to a gesture towards your garden and pavilion. Um, and actually, when you look at that thrust, what's underneath the highest portion of that butterfly wing is more the opaque service laden component of that, those two pavilions. So hopefully you can maybe comment as to why you oriented them that way, as opposed to facing the other direction, in a sense, opening up the journey towards, um, you know, towards the rest of your garden. The last point yeah. has to, uh, sorry, because I, I, I would like to just shut up and have everybody comment. Um, the last thing is sort of like the visual access or physical access to the counseling center which is this very uh, hard line, unforgiven path that's going up these stairs to, the, uh, you know, going up to the counseling center. And I wonder if there could have been an attitude about that path, that approach, that maybe you can visually see it from the meditation pavilion. You see it up the hill and it creates intrigue as to, you know, how you get there. And part of that journey of going towards counseling is not this very, uh, uh, and forgive me for using this word because I just can't find a better word and a seemingly oppressive path towards this counseling center as opposed to 
a much more softer, sinuous, as I'm going, it's almost like I'm going to the confession room to, to shed my sins, right? But along the path, I'm like, oh my God, I'm climbing this uh, unforgiving path to the counseling center. So I wonder if there could have been a much more softer touch, just like the rest of your presentation, because it's just glorious, the, 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 your pr presentation overall. But that path to the counseling center, I wonder what your thoughts are with regards to that axial, very strong axial approach to it. And that's my comment. Thank you. Great, great stuff. Jin Dobre, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, so so this there, so the the path. Um, yeah, I, I agree, of course. Um, there could have been a more like softer approach um, in, in this in to, to the counseling center, but I think, um, well, my thinking here was that I wanted these medical workers to feel important and special and their journey to kind of remind of going to, to a temple at the top of the hill. So this is why it's, um, so in general, this part, this picture is garden is, um, you, you know, very organic and everything, but this is the only part which is very axial and this is why um, this is why I chose to um, to have that that access here to um, to make them feel important, like they're going to to a temple, to like you know Acropolis in, in Greece or something like that. Um, and another call, um, answer to your question about the roof, I'll zoom into to the um, to the section here. Um, so I did. Um, that's why the, the butterfly um, shape was created because I wanted to open it up to, towards the garden and also um, from the, the approach, the threshold. I also wanted the, um, the visitors to, to see a little bit of that structure. So um, when we're standing here, we, we don't see, um, I don't think it, it, it really feels like it's open to the campus, but we see a little bit of that wooden structure. So that big concrete solid wall is not, it's, it's creating that moment of suspense, but it's not scary. It's like inviting at the same time. It's, it's saying like, hey, this is a really blank wall, but there's something going on behind it. So go and explore. Great. Um, a lot uh, we need to we need to move towards uh, final remarks. So so uh, do any other members of the jury have any uh, uh, final uh, comments before we hand it over to Professor Kelly for uh, final remarks? Okay, so I think we're handing it over to you, Professor Kelly, Chair. Thank you, Zuzana. Thank you for a. Uh... Uh, a, a great semester. I, I looked forward to Thursday afternoons to having the time to talk with you because you were always abounding with good spirit and um, lots of energy. And meeting at five o'clock from five to six every Thursday, I, I didn't necessarily have the same level of good spirit and energy that you, you brought to the conversation. So number one, never lose that. I think that's important. Number two is that the magnitude of this project in dealing with landscape uh, probably consumed an inordinate, inordinate amount of, um, of Zuzana's energies throughout the course of the semester. Um, I don't understand why it is that architects preoccupy themselves with buildings. Um, it strikes me is that, that buildings and landscape, buildings and city, cities and landscape, they, they, they all go together. And, um, and we, we, tend to, we tend to work the muscle group for buildings at the expense of landscape. And I think that this project, um, it, it, in my mind, it's the landscape that is much more developed and the buildings perhaps that, that need some, some TLC down the line. I, I like the idea, and, and I think Douglas hit home on, on this partly because Douglas is an insider to this business. Uh, his wife is a, is a physician and, and so very much involved in understanding the stress that, that these folks go through. Um, but I think Douglas hit on something that it doesn't necessarily need to be an either or, that, that, that if we went back and looked at the entire campus plan, there could be little cookie crumbs around the campus that ultimately led down 
a tree lined street to this, this complex that, that you know, is endowed by some great, great benefactor and acts as a kind of major catharsis for uh, individuals at, at certain points in time. So the, 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 the idea might be that you could have immediate places to break out, to, to breathe outdoors, and then there could be other places that are more comprehensive kind of landscape. And it could, it could have been part of a bigger uh, kind of campus plan. Um, you know, I think that the, the, the comments about noise that, that Dana made were right on, and that's where I think about things like water, things about the sound of trees, uh, the things about um, uh, perhaps having chimes or stuff that mask the, 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 the daily stuff. But I, I live next to a firehouse and I keep wondering why, they, why do we need sirens in the first place? Isn't this the 21st century? Couldn't cars be equipped to, and won't they be equipped when we have eventually have uh, autonomous vehicles to just respond and get the heck out of the way? It's a 19th century thing. And the boys that drive the fire trucks love to blast that horn, uh, you know, all kinds of points in time. But I think that's a very well taken comment that that noise, that, 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 that we've seen in a number of different theses of really trying to, uh, trying to embrace the sort of holistic of century um, uh, aspect of the site, even uh, planting fauna that attracts certain kinds of birds or butterflies to distract from, from other things that are going on. Um, the, the issue of the building tectonics, I think is something that uh, it, you know, we could save for another day, another conversation. I think that I think the buildings all require another level of pass um, in terms of the development of the language of those. I think they're, they're a bit sketchy at the moment. Um, but I, I want to go back to the thing that everybody's commented upon, which is the, the graphics and reveal to everybody that going into this about two or three weeks ago, Zuzana asked me um, if she could present drawings that were made by hand. And, and I kind of laughed and said, well, you know, all the theses are done digitally. And I said, well, that wasn't always the case. It doesn't need to be the case. There's, there's no requirement that you need to do it digitally. And yesterday we talked about, um, for some period of time yesterday, we were discussing the limitations of computer graphics. And, and I would ar argue that all media have limitations. They have parameters. And that, and that exploring those parameters and shifting uh, between different media is, is really important to do. Um, you know, I find if I draw something in charcoal, I can capture something that I cannot capture if I try to draw with line. And I've been spending a lot of time, as Matt Bell knows, the past couple of weeks curating uh, my drawings on a new website. Um, and, and, and I've been kind of looking at the drawings in the context of types of drawings and what information they convey um, and I think this sort of sensory information, at least the visual, the sense of shade and shadow, the sense of light, the sense of being in warming light, um, the, 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 these drawings have a great appeal and they, they communicate things that perhaps a photorealistic digital drawing might not do as readily. But also, and I've seen this on other theses, it doesn't mean it has to be one or the other, that you could be, you could be into the idea of hybridizing. So I think the drawing on the far left that we're looking at is perhaps an example of that, that it has perhaps a digital counterpart that lies underneath this as a kind of underdrawing that then is embellished by uh, the hand of the author. Anyhow, um, uh, I, I really want to thank you for a great semester, great semester plus the semester before, um, and uh, wish you all the be best. Gratulacje, uh, I think is the way we would say it in Polish, but I probably didn't say it correctly anyhow. Terrific. <laughs> Terrific. Thank you so much. Thank you also. Congratulations, <laughs> Thank Susanna. Thank you for the great semester. <laughs> Thank great you. Job. All right. Terrific. Great, so um, this brings us to our final uh, uh, presenter and thesis candidate, uh, Jemima Asamoa, um, who will be telling us about a project on the Anacostia River uh, momentarily.
Good morning, distinguished jurists, faculty, friends, and thank you to everyone who is here today. My name is Jemima Samo, and I'll be discussing my thesis topic, Beyond Sustainability. Before I continue, I'd like to express my appreciation to my thesis chair, Professor Julie Gabrielli. Thank you so much for all your effort and time you spent with me on this project. I'd also like to thank all the faculty, and especially to Professor Liz DeMay, for your guidance and direction throughout the semester. Also, I would like to thank my family and friends for all your, your support, and most importantly, God, for taking me through my entire education. This thesis basically seeks to explore how the principles of regenerative urban design can be used to enhance and improve the quality of life in blighted urban areas. Regenerative design provides a rationalized approach to create restorative environments that encourages community engagement, which leads to economic and social benefits. The concept of regenerative design going beyond sustainability emphasizes design that promotes a symbiotic relationship between the local community and the natural environment for the mutual benefit of both parties. Anacostia and other neighborhoods in Ward 8 of the District of Columbia are just one of many neighborhoods in urban areas battling with the challenges of urban growth, including deteriorating infrastructure, economic decline, and segregated neighborhoods, which has led to the decrease in quality of life of residents in these areas. With the mere mention of Anacostia, the main thing that comes into the mind of people is a blighted under resourced neighborhood, which has become an economic and cultural divide for the District of Columbia. But it wasn't always this way. The historic neighborhood of Anacostia was once a thriving settlement of native in American Indians who settled along the eastern banks of the Anacostia River. They were farmers and fishermen and were driven away by European settlers. Today, the area is predominantly an African American community and is characterized by the effects of unemployment, high poverty rates, and fiscal district. While the, er the early African-American settlers were also involved in the tradition of backyard farming, the neighborhoods today are characterized by a rich culture of arts, river festivals, and music that celebrates their culture. Just a few miles away from the upscale neighborhoods located at the opposite bank of the river, the poverty level of neighborhoods in the Ward 8 continues to increase with 47% of residents living below the poverty line, which is three times higher than the rest of the wards in the DC. Food deserts, which make up about 11% of DC's total area, have a majority of them concentrated in the neighborhoods of Southeast DC, including Anacostia. In its simplest form, Regenerative design strives for positive impact, which involves both users of the building and the environment in which the building, the design is located. Most of the current definitions of sustainable design aims to minimize pollution and energy. But on the other hand, regenerative design evolves from less bad techniques of sustainability to integrating the needs of the society and nature. It operates to create environmental conditions to support life, enhancing the quality of life, and repairing ecosystems. A successful example of how regenerative urban design has enhanced an urban area is the Changichang Restoration Project in Seoul, South Korea, a design initiative which redeveloped an 18 lane elevated freeway over the Changichang River into a revitalized stream with green public spaces. The project spread an economic growth and development in an area that had languished over several decades. And the ripple effect resulted in enhancing the urban environment, restoring the historical value, value of the downtown. Initiatives such as the Anacostia Waterfront Initiative and the 11th Street Bridge design have been put in place to regenerate and restore the Anacostia River and its environs. Proposals for the Anacostia Park as part of the Anacostia Water Initiative include the provision of active neighborhood recreation spaces with new and improved park facilities. 
The principles of regenerative design are, main, are aimed to make the built environment more appealing and to enhance and create opportunities for communities to thrive. Regenerative engineered solutions such as rain gardens, green roofs and walls and biosphiles when implemented into an innovative urban design promotes urban restoration. The site for this thesis is the current location of the Anacostia Recreation Center, bounded to the north by the Anacostia River, to the south by the Fairlawn and Anacostia neighborhood and the Kenilworth Avenue Freeway. The existing pool for the recreation center has a history of being one of the sites for the fight of integration, for the fight for integration during the civil rights movement. One of the major site constraints is that the site is separated from the neighboring communities by existing highway and infrastructure. Pedestrian access from the neighborhood to the is by a bridge which this thesis also proposes to replace. The figure ground map shows the relationship of the city grid and the separation of the site. The site is also located within one mile radius of the Potomac Avenue and Anacostia Metro Station. In planning the site, the main driving principles In planning the site, the main driving principles was the design of an engaging waterfront, providing food sovereignty, and of providing a sense of place through the efficient site design. The proposal seeks to provide spaces for learning, playing, gathering, relaxing, and growing. Based on the continuation of the urban grid, the site is zoned into three main sectors. The recreation center, playground and sports facilities, and community garden areas. The design proposed makes the biking and walking trails along the river more organic and pedestrianized. A major design guideline was the maintenance of the existing pool because of its historic significance. The aerial view and site section shows the site layout with a green bridge connecting to the neighborhood beyond the highway for easy access to the site. The design of the Anacostia Recreation Center was guided by biophilic design principles, which proposes to provide spaces that enhance direct and indirect experiences with nature. The building form was guided by a linear layout to enhance the flow of natural light and air. Circulation was based on continuation of the city grid, which merges the, with the building to form a pedestrian bridge, which provides direct access to the site and the recreation center. The building is designed to be a continuous pedestrianized public waterfront connecting the park and the surrounding neighborhoods. This creates an active living waterfront experience. The building emerges by merging the strict city layout with the more organic layout of the riverfront. The building integrates with the topography and includes a sequence of reception, learning and recreation spaces, as well as providing a sense of place for Native American sculptures and exhibition and gathering on the rooftop park. On the lower level or the ground floor, Users can access the building from the main entrance or from an entry pavilion on the, from the roof bridge. Users are then oriented to learning spaces, multi-purpose meeting halls, indoor gymnasium, indoor pool, the learning center and library, and the demonstration kitchen areas. The second level houses administrative spaces and other recreation spaces, which includes an indoor running truck and other spaces for community engagement. The elevations show how the building merges into the topography and creates access, which includes running trucks and walkways to the bridge park. The green roof solution responds to the desire of the building to possibly cool itself 
reducing reliance on cooling systems during warmer temperatures. So back to my thesis question, how has the principles of regenerative design helped me to use biophilia to help as a tool to help in, and improve the urban quality of life? The 3D view or the main exterior view of the new recreation center shows the integration of landscape and building elements to form an engaging world of fun experience. The existing pool now has direct access and views to the Anacostia River and Riverfront Promenade. The rooftop amphitheater with views to the river provides a unique experience for users to gather and celebrate culture. The sloping ends of the roof, which form roof gardens, integrate with the landscape and provide open areas for relaxation and access to the Green Bridge. The permeable shoreline experience of the shoreline, sorry, the proposed permeable shoreline of the river transforms from terraforma to wetlands during high rains and floods, and this restores and regenerates the site's ecosystems. The green wall and the use of natural materials in the, at the entrance lounge of the recreation center blurs the boundaries between the outdoor and indoor environment. Introduction of greenery and the use of natural and local materials enhances users' indirect experiences with nature. The demonstration kitchen in the new recreation center is purposely to provide a sense of place for natives and their expression of culture. Finally, this last view shows the edge condition of the site and how the site of the new recreation center forms a relationship with the riverfront promenade and walkway. Thank you, and I welcome your contribution and comments. Great, thank you, uh, Jemima. We see your mural address is there. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Great. I guess I can start by saying congratulations on a job well done. Um, I think you have a really comprehensive project and a really strong strategy in kind of dealing with a lot of the issues that the community is currently facing in terms of access to community resources and, and public spaces. I guess I do have a question as to how you refined your program, because I, I don't want to say it's the kitchen sink, but you do have quite a few a variety of programs. And so was there, what was the sort of research process? How did you distill what you ended up uh, including in your building? Okay, um, so during my research for this program, I realized that there's been proposals for the development of a new recreation center. So the program mainly came from that and then also um, additional spaces came from the research and the kind of spaces that would help or people would enjoy in a recreation center. I guess one thing I'm, I'm, I was really uh, interested in and I, and I really loved the idea of was the sort of demonstration kitchen. Um, I haven't spent a lot of time on Anacostia, but I do know that it is a food desert. I think they said that like on the, is it the east bank of the river, there's only three grocery stores throughout. Um, and I kind of just wish, like, were you, are there any opportunities on this site to have, I don't know, a farmer's market or some sort of other additional food programming? Because I, I just know that that's kind of a complaint I've heard from people in the community and just, just from my time and being in the area myself. So um, I think I mentioned it in my 
presentation. But then if you look at the site plan, it's a bit cut off here. The site mm -hmm. is about 41 acres. So the main development of the recreation center is centered in the middle and then proposed for these areas like the B area to be community farms where people can have access to fresh food. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think that the, the recreation center as a building is super well integrated. I love the way it ties back over to the neighborhood. Um, it, it seems like it's got a, a really comprehensive program and is really thought out. I think my, my only comments would just be to ask, you know, in terms of this seems like a big and really important site in terms of tying the neighborhood back to the waterfront. Or, um, and I was just wondering, I, I saw the farms there, but other distributed program that draws the community over. I just wonder if a, there's a certain audience who thinks about going to a recreation center and in terms of reactivating this broad swath of public space, you know, um, sort of diversifying the program, you know, allowing for outdoor, you know, events, uh, festivals, music events, and then for everyday people, um, you know, I think what we're learning about public space is just the smallest things can draw people over and activate it. Um, if somebody's going for a walk and they know they can grab a coffee, um, uh, you know, I, I just did a big public project down in Florida and it was funny, the biggest thing that, that the the neighborhood wanted near a beach was a hot dog stand, just like a place where they could get a hot dog for their kids while they were playing on the beach. And, you know, the notion that when parents bring kids over to the rec center, things for them to do, you know, that are adult things, take a stroll, have a coffee. Um, I see you have a cafeteria in here and the kitchen, but those are really focused programs. Just like, I wonder if it could be enriched by a little more informal programming and, um, uh, sort of less anchored programming in the, in the distributed site. I think the building seems from what I can see to be really solidly thought out. Right. So um, while I was designing this recreation center, I think to answer your question or to talk about the points you made, the main target group was one initially the people of Anacostia or the people in Ward 8. And then also to connect people from um, adjoining neighborhoods. Like um, one thing I proposed was to turn there's an existing railway center, a railway line, which is just across the highway, along the highway. So I proposed to turn that into like, there's a rail to trail system where rail lines are turned into kind of parks and walkways where people can come in. So there are two schools, I think the high school and then the middle school who, who can also get access to the building itself. And then that, covers, I think, the youth who can come to the place. There's also um, space for kids. Um, and then the cafeteria, as you mentioned, and then I also have space for seniors, like a senior center where people can come and socialize and, and yeah. Yeah, I think that that all seems really terrific. It works really well. Um, I, 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 it's, it's just a little comment it's to come up a couple times of thinking of the different potential you I think you I think you like hit a home run on the on the users you you focused on I think it's just an encouragement to think about public space and who all the different potential users might be and you can't give everybody all things right mm -hmm. but yeah the more people you can draw over um it's so funny, like the like to give parents something to do while they're there means they'll bring mm -hmm. their kids over three times a week instead of once, you know, like yeah. that, that kind of idea. Right. Hey, Jemima. Um, really great project. Um, I, I was taking some time to look at your process sketches at the bottom, which I think are really, really nice. Um, I can see you explored a lot of ideas uh, and you have a good, good sketch hand, too. Um, so I really like those process sketches. Um, Thank you. Um, and I, I think the 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 approach, uh, the part T of your your intervention here, I think is is uh, formally pretty successful. You know, there's um, there's plenty of instances of these these sort of bridges that sort of span 
wide boulevards or highways. Um, uh, there's one in Chicago, I think that Renzo Piano did. And there's there's yeah. some others. So I think, uh, which sounds like you're familiar with that and probably use it as a precedent. Um, my main question though is, because um, I think we're sort of wrestling with this, um, th this, this sort of new urban type, if you will, of, you know, how do we mend you know, segregated parts of, of neighborhoods and not segregated by race, but just, you know, segregating pieces of land that were segregated by these, these infrastructures that we lay, you know, 50, 60 years ago. I wonder if, it, did you ever think about proposing multiple uh, um, approach points for, for the site across the, across the highway here instead of one? Um, yes, I did actually. In my initial sketches, I don't know if it's showing here, but I had like multiple bridges to connect the people. But then I also found out about the rail to the rail, the rail that is not being used. And then felt like that would be a good connection point to bring people from all the other side, come to the main rail and then join or move to the recreation center on the bridge. So I kind of thought about it in my initial iterations, but then I ended up doing one main bridge and then mm -hmm. letting people come in from the rail to trail system. Sure, sure. And I, I don't I don't I don't necessarily think that's a right or wrong answer, but I do think, you know, and, and it sounds like you've already thought about it, but I do think it is a good question to sort of ponder. Um, because I think that's, you know, again, you know, how do we we're struggling with this question as a as a profession, you know, how do we heal these these fissures in our landscape? Um, um, and I think one of the ways to do that is where appropriate, you know, reestablish the the connectivities of grids, um, previous grids, or reintroduce grids where they didn't exist to again try to connect to to, to the landscape. Um, you know, the more connectivity, in, in most cases, the more connectivity you have to a to a um, to a certain place, uh, to a sort to a certain site within the landscape. I think the more accessible it becomes. You know, maybe different different uh, vantage points. Um, so I, I would just. Um, I, I would I would keep that in the back of your 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 head as you sort of you know um, you know take this project uh, which which is nicely done and sort of add things to it um, uh, and improve it you know I I would really think about these sort of multiple connectivity points across this um, um, across this uh, the the highway there to sort of connect that yeah. I would just like to quickly add in I think you should look at Riverbank State Park in New York City. Um, which is um, overlooking the West uh, River as a really great example. And, and, and honestly, very similar scale, very similar program. Um, and I, I, I just I completely agree with Mark um, with the comment about just like getting over the highway. I think uh, for it to really be more open and better utilized, I think you're probably gonna need more than one connection. And if I'm looking correctly at your, your sort of Earth Im or Google Earth image, you actually already have that existing bridge or there's some sort of connection and so maybe yeah. you actually offer two points on either end and then you have three points of entry into the site um but i think it, it one it helps to promote greater entry into the site but it also helps people to feel more comfortable that they're not like landlocked in between yeah. the, the, the um the water and the road itself right thank you so uh jemima it's uh matt bell can you hear me yes i can very yeah, go ahead, matt. Very impressive, and I, I think this is terrific. And um, but I have a couple of comments about things that I think could be stronger. I mean, I love this idea of an artificial ground plane that becomes a kind of public terrace um, that is also a green roof there. Um, and I, and and just the, the whole idea of weaving this in like that, I think, is is really terrific. Um, in the multiple points, I guess. Um, I guess. I'm sort of agnostic about that because at one level where you've chosen to make the bridge, it does connect across to a school. And I think there is some other um, amenities nearby there that maybe one could argue are, are good places to connect. But, you know, I think that probably couldn't hurt it, although I can understand why you did what you did. I guess the thing, a couple of comments for me, number one, I think there is a perspective missing, which is what it would be like to stand on top of this. I don't think you have it. I'm looking, I don't think you have it and see the U S Capitol and the skyline of Washington and standing up there. Do you have that? 
Um, is that what that it is? It doesn't go that far, but then on the amphitheater, you can see the water. I th then... Yeah, I think there's a little bit of a missed opportunity. It'd be really yeah. nice to have some sort of panorama there that really places this thing, because I think you would have really outstanding views of the monumental core. That's one thing. The second thing is, in terms of the planning of this, I think I would be inclined to find a way to plan this so that the drop-off was closer to the senior center and that maybe flipping the program the other way and given the sort of sinewy character of this, um, I think it'd be easily done so that you came and arrived at that open kind of forum area with the columns and you could see through that when you arrived in the car and then you could maybe get to the senior center on one side and the rest of the community center on the other side because i think right now when i look at how seniors have to traverse this to get down i think the left side of your plan is the senior center in gray is that right yeah yeah i i, I think maybe the way in which it could be that that open area which i quite like between the pool and the and the garden there um i think if that were the arrival and you came there and one side you went to seniors and one side you went to the to the community center I think it would be programmatically easier on the seniors and it would be, um, I, I think that'd be an easy change to accommodate. The other comment I have, which I would love to walk up on top of this building and you know, run around it and stuff, uh, two other comments. One is um, I think some of the lower level um, program uses, some of the skylights you've made there could be more robust and more figural Imagine them lit up at night with these lanterns coming through um, through yeah. the roof of the building. That could really be fantastic, you know, looking at this landscape with these glass lanterns there. So I would encourage those to be more robust. And then the other thing is, um, since this terrace is such a great place and having spent so much time watching youth soccer games with my girls when they were growing up, um, I wonder a little bit about whether the exterior spaces could be organized in such a way that the terrace could be a viewing play platform for the parents to stand in such a way to overlook either basketball games or, or soccer or what else, whatever the community feels is most important. I understand the terrace you made right there at the sort of concave part of the plan, but from a kind of practical thing, being able to stand up there and watch your kids play and have a place to socialize for the parents I think would be nice. And I think maybe some of the sports fields off to the side could maybe engage the curve and, and be something that you could occupy like that. But, you know, my comments, I have very much um, admiration for what you've done here. I think it's uh, complete. The plan is nicely worked out. It seems like a believable building. I think the perspectives are are very compelling and it seemed like a place that families would want to go to. And I think with a couple of additional perspectives, you could really root it in the landscape of the Anacostia Basin in such a way that makes it a unique and memorable experience. Nice right. job. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Maddie? Oh, sorry. sorry. Uh, Jemima, uh, I'm thoroughly convinced by your building and I'm about ready to hop on my bike and uh, ride down and enjoy it. So uh, kudos for a lovely project. Thank you. Uh, I, have, uh, I have a few uh, questions and thoughts. Um, I guess the first thought is um, I'm, I'm all for the idea of greater connectivity to the neighborhoods. Um, Anacostia Park is such a vast uh, and largely unused resource because it's so cut off, as you, as you mentioned. And uh, while I think you picked the right spot for a major connection, where the high school and middle school kids can, uh, you know, easily come across, um, I'm thinking about the younger children also. And it just seems like it's such a long hike to get to that one bridge. So I'm thinking greater connectivity would be a real Plus, uh, I'm wondering whether greater connectivity would lead to um, some economic development along that edge, uh, you know, going back to the idea of coffee and hot dogs. Um, and I'm also thinking that you spoke to us about um, the precedent in South Korea where, uh, you know, the city made a very radical move to just take away the highway. Uh, I think taking away the highway here, you know, of course, would meet tremendous resistance because it's an important route. Um, 
Uh, but I wonder if you studied at all the idea of uh, depressing it. Uh, you know, maybe that's problematic because of the river and the, you know, I'm sure high water table there. But I do wonder if uh, you thought about radical moves that would really restore this resource to the community rather than just accepting the fact that, uh, you know, here Anacostia has been given a park, but, you know, hardly any way to use it at all. So that's a thought. Uh, another thought is whether, um, you know, uh, if you had to keep the highway, if you thought about possibly more radical connections like, uh, you know, building, building buildings across uh, there. And then um, just uh, two more questions. One is, have you thought about a relationship to the 11th Street Bridge Park? And finally, um, you know, I see you building here for the future and really looking, looking ahead to a, a great future and thinking about, uh, you know, wa uh, water level rise, thinking about the ecology. And I know that there's a, a push to clean up the Anacostia. So just wondering if you'd thought about including uses of the river, such as, uh, you know, boating, perhaps swimming, and incorporating that into your planning for the park. Right. Um, so to your first question about the connectivity, um, my initial iterations, I thought about a radical move of making the whole building go over the highway and then still making it pedestrianized where people can come in. But then um, I knew that will, will, will cause a lot of problems and a lot of like pushbacks. So one of the main things as I decided to do is to capitalize on the existing bridge and just use that as the main connection to bring people into the site. And um, to your second question, so right now, what is existing on site is that is the um, the Anacostia Drive, which connects people probably from the 11th Street Bridge to the site. So the main thing I did, which was maybe not that of a big move, was to pedestrianize the um, the drive and then bring it to the back of the of the new recreation center itself, and then still just make the whole drive and the whole walkway pedestrianized to join the 11th Street Bridge. But then it wasn't a, like a major thing that I was looking at for this design. The main thing was just to pedestrianize the river walk and the walkway to kind of join the 11th Street Bridge. Um, great. Uh, Zena? Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Jamima, this is great. I, I echo the comments that everybody's made. So thank you for your presentation. Um, so I have a few comments and um, um, questions, too. So I, yeah. um, one kind of picks off with the fact that I think what another juror might have alluded to is that this is a, is a destination you know, usage right now in terms of the community center that, that one intentionally is probably gonna wanna come to as opposed to stumble upon. Um, so one of the things that I was uh, looking at um, is uh, the, the wonderful pedestrian bridge, understanding that, um, you know, it's development that drives economy in areas like this are very, very important. Um, so really thinking about how this experience starts here. Um, and so you sort of land at this pedestrian bridge, but I think you need to extend this to think about, um, to imply what the impact is. This looks residential. I mean, how do people even, um, you know, think about uh, getting on this bridge? What is the beginning experience? Can it broaden to allow um, wonderful uses, uh, you know, um, retail uses, uh, outdoor, um, you know, uh, pop-ups and the like. Um, so this becomes more of an experience and, and less of just a path, a, a to in and froing to get from here to here. Because this is a wonderful opportunity to really um, think about how you, in, uh, you know, infuse uh, the economy here in this area. So that's, that's one of my comments. Um, the other, I'll go on, on the on the other side. I know the Anacostia River is um, is it might be either number one or number two as in terms of the the, the um, dirtiest river in the in the United States. And so I love the way you have 
I love this project for that reason <laughs> that, that you are addressing um, biophilic design to, to, to solve this issue. Um, the use of the bioretention um, gardens, they, they seem, and you might, you might have looked at this, but they seem um, small, you know, in, in terms of really uh, fulfilling the purpose of, of um, you know, for this development of cleaning the water before it gets dumped into the Anacostia. So, and that, that's just proportionately looking at it, but you may have studied that and, and feel like that, that um, you know, it, it's enough. Um, but I, I would look at that because I think that's something that, that really should be amplified um, in this, um, sorry, in this um, particular scheme. Um, my other question is, I do agree with, uh, I think one of the, some, one of the jurors talked about um, really broadening um, the, the visitorship, thinking about ways to, to diversify this more, although I, I agree and understand that it's um, for the Anacostia community, but um, diversity of people is always going to um, just lead to a better result and um, speak to that economic um, issue that we talked about. Uh, someone comment, commented on the sinuous form of the building, which I think is beautiful. I think it's oriented properly um, from a sustainable, sustainability perspective. And then my one of my last comments um, outside of, uh, well, well, first, I think the only area where you have parking isn't really showing up here. And I hate to talk about parking um, in, in such a beautiful scheme, but um, there needs to be, I think it's over here somewhere. But there needs to be some thought as to, um, you know, how one uh, arriving by car gets to wherever they're going. So I would just look at that a little bit more and, and, and make sure that there's a clear way um, for vehicular as well as uh, pedestrian approach to this building. Then my last comment um, relates to the pool. But, you know, the pool is an existing asset in the community. And so it's going to hold not only it's going to hold a lot of history, um, a lot of tradition for, for this neighborhood. And I think um, I think there may be you might want to think about celebrating it a little bit more. And it appears as if it's just kind of been left in its original condition and just kind of sit, sitting there. But perhaps there's a way to to um, to cherish that or celebrate that more as something that's been an anchor in this community for quite some time. And those are my comments, but overall, fantastic job. Thank you. Um, I think speaking to the topic of the parking, right now, what's on the side is just like um, a street parking along the Anacostia Drive, which is around here. So because my proposal plans to move this drive to the back of the new design, I plan to like bring some parking to the side. So you park and then you can just walk along the river walk to the, the building itself and then services and then um, ADA so, um, like services and then other cars can just use the back drive which is now proposed and then come to the back of the house to access the building on the on this side as well okay got it thank you um we have a couple of faculty raised hands want to acknowledge those um Brian thank you Jamie uh, I just wanted to say that number one, the, the idea uh, that, that Professor Simon put forward of uh, swimming in the Anacostia is not all that crazy, apparently. Um, the um, last week I was reading that within the next 10 years, uh, the Anacostia will be ready for us to be able to recreate, to swim and to eat fish out of it. So Zena, we're cleaning up our act here in more ways than one in Washington, DC. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, Giovanna, the, the, the work that you've done on this since the last time I saw this project about a month ago is just tremendous. And I, I really think it's a great testament. There were a lot of different things thrown at you in that um, uh, penultimate meeting. Um, and you picked up just about every single thing we talk, talked about and provided a very um, elegant response to the critique that you received then. So I, I'm, I'm very impressed. Thank and you. I was impressed uh, a, a month ago, uh, and even more so now. I'm always impressed with the way in which students, how they respond to critique, and you've done so in a, in a very professional and, and rigorous manner. So congratulations. 
Thank you. Terrific. Uh, Michelle uh, Lamprakos. Uh, Jemima, I feel the same way. I had the privilege of serving as your third committee member and didn't see this a lot of times, but did see it a month ago. And I was excited about it now. And like Brian, I'm just um, full of admiration. And I, I can't wait to see where you go in your career with all these ideas. I just want to um, echo what Zena said uh, about the swimming pool. Um, you know, I teach a course on monuments and memory. Um, and this is such an amazing thing to me that you've, you've essentially preserved not only a, a swimming pool, but really a, a monument of the civil rights movement in DC. And um, I just want to applaud you for that. Um, maybe you could say a bit more about how, how you thought to integrate that into your scheme. Right, so um, during my research about the Anacostia Recreation Center and pool, I think I found out that um, um, in the past, I think during the civil rights movement, it used to be um, a white only pool. And then it, it came up that has to be segregated. And then one time when um, black, a, a couple of black boys came to the pool, they were driven away and then it became a whole new case. So I think it led the discussion which helped with um, kind of desegregating these pools and these um, social areas. So that I felt like the pool had like some significant history behind it. And then if we are redesigning this recreation center, it would be a good thing to kind of conserve the pool. But yeah. Terrific. Is, is that it, Michelle? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mide. Um, hi, how are you? Can you hear me? Yes, I can yes. hear you. Yeah, a fant fantastic project, and I'm, I'm really uh, happy that you are able to share uh, your insights, your design chops, and uh, everything with, with the group. Um, just phenomenal uh, through and through. Um, I have a question with regards to creating these kind of spaces that are, in a sense, amenity spaces for a community. And with that, obviously being in an inner city, especially near Anacostia, there's issue of security, right? Like how, how do you, how do you, how, how do you create safe places physically for people to inhabit? And part of it, part of the solution is actually thinking about the program that you're bringing to the site. For example, I would ask you, what happens at 5 p.m. when this community center closes, right? Where it's dark, and there's no eyes on the street, so to speak. Um, and I wonder if that could have been mitigated by, you know, somebody mentioned the addition of maybe adding retail or a restaurant or something that kind of keeps this lively at night. Um, as uh, Professor Bell said, you know, it'd be great if I can sit on that rooftop during 4th of July and watch the fireworks, right? Like all this stuff's sort of happening. But these are seminal almost um, blips of events that happened that would bring people there at night. Um, are there any thoughts for how this recreational center or strip or zone operates at twilight when, this, when the center closes? And, and did you think of any programmatic solutions that might help that? Right, um, so when it comes to the issue of security, one of the main things that was driving this project is to make this a more pedestrianized and have people. There are lots of bike riders, there are lots of people who go for walks, especially in the evenings. So what I wanted to do is to kind of create this link, especially, and yes, with street lights and everything where people can just um, use the bridge and then maybe use the runway, go and then use the river walk and not even going to the building, but then still having access to the site, still experiencing the site. So people would have, uh, be riding their bikes, people will be going for runs with lights on top of the bridge and not necessarily visiting the buildings. I felt like that um, was a bit solving the issue of security and people having people always being on the bridge, not necessarily just being in the recreation center before you can use the bridge. The bridges can be used by anybody. And then you just have, you are able to access um, the building itself from the bridge whenever you want to. 
So, so that goes to the question that I think Marquise brought up earlier. Or I can't remember who brought it up about, about connectivity, right? Yeah. Creating, creating this sort of like closed or sort of open loop, so to speak, so that when people, you know, I think Zena mentioned also the fact that this is in effect a destination, right? You sort of cross that bridge, you arrive there, you go on the promenade and then you sort of leave. I think that secondary exit out of it that keeps the pedestrian flowing, that keeps them moving in from different parts of the neighborhood is part of the equation that might mitigate this being almost like a, you know, sort of a destination that's not open-ended that people sort of, but then when it's closed at 5 p.m. sort of like, okay, what happens there? Is it safe enough for me to, so is it safe to sort of weave people through from different parts of the neighborhood? So I think that's probably where the connectivity becomes important back to the neighborhood. That's not just at the bridge, but um, overall, I think it's a fantastic project. I, I like your biophilic, um, uh, you know, intervention here. Um, you know, I want to go there and dip my toes in the water just by looking at your renderings. And and actually, one one last thing: the massing that you've created, the sort of architecture that you've created. When I'm on the water looking back, is not this sort of like oppressive feeling, even though it's a single language of these sort of slats that run through the facade. But I think by introducing nature to sort of maybe over time have nature overgrow it and encompass, and um, you know, the, the, the physicality of the building, I think it, it just sort of roots it in, into the landscape, which I think is actually quite marvelous. All right, thank you. Um, terrific, thank you, Mide. Um, so before we, um, move to uh, the final remarks of um, Jemima's chair. We just want to be sure that all the members of the, uh, all of our guests uh, have had a, had a chance to, uh, to comment. Um, if there are any final comments that the jury would like to make, uh, that would be great. James, if I, if I yep, can. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just once again, this is a terrific building. And I think we can't help but want to expand this because what our firm has come to think about projects like this is public infrastructure, right? And when you build infrastructure, you want infrastructure to serve the greatest amount it can. And so the reciprocal nature between this and the park, this and the neighborhood, just it builds on itself, right? And this becomes yeah. more successful. The neighborhood becomes more successful. So I hope you don't feel we haven't spent enough time on your wonderful building, but we can't help but to think about this in those terms on how this builds and expands, serves the most people. And when those connections are made and the more the more that those connections are, are walkable, the more they serve the immediate neighborhood um, and, and they just build on themselves. So we can't help but look at this. You know, I look at it as a piece of it's not an amenity, it's a piece of public infrastructure that's gonna build and serve this community and build and help the community build and sustain itself. So that's, I think the inclination you keep hearing to more connectivity, that's serve fair. more kinds of people, the, as, as the building that you sought out to do, I think it's wonderful. Right. Thank you. Terrific, thanks, uh, Vince. Um, uh, Peter, you have a brief comment? Whoop, Peter, are you there? <laughs> I guess we lost Peter. Uh, Peter? Ah, okay. Uh, before Peter speaks, um, any other uh, uh, jury uh, comments that we, uh, we haven't heard yet? <laughs> I think Peter, uh, your sound is down. Thank okay. You. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, with, with that, uh, we're going to, uh, to move to uh, uh, Julie Gabrielli, who was uh, Jemima's chair, and she will uh, deliver some final, final remarks. I like the charades that Peter was trying to do <laughs> for his comments. Uh, sorry to laugh about that. Um, yeah, I'm just so um, pleased uh, uh, at both um, Jemima's presentation, but also um, all of the comments and questions and um, 
feedback from the panel. Um, just wanted to say a few things. One is that, um, as we all can see, it's a very ambitious project. Um, I think that uh, Jemima was really challenging the whole paradigm of a rec center. If you look at the aerial of what's there now, it's just like this little brick building and this pool and then like a lot of worn down land, um, which is better than nothing. Uh, so I think she made an effort to welcome all DC residents by tying into these larger networks and plans for the Anacostia, but also to serve, especially as we've been talking, to serve the needs of, of the Anacostia um, community with all of the programming that she's providing. Um, and I love that we had this, uh, they all had this whole conversation about the, the connections back to the community, including the, the Green Bridge and whether there should be more of those. Um, I think that's a, a really rich um, exploration. Uh, and I also um, really enjoyed being in on the, or just sort of being a witness to the, um, to Jemima's exploration of regenerative, regenerative design and biophilia, uh, because uh, she was thinking of them as frameworks, but also tools. And I think ultimately they could be seen as a, they can be used as a measure of, of success of a project. And that um, taking such a big vision of integrating urban communities with the natural environment, um, whether on a large site like this or in very small increments on a, on a project by project basis. I think this is a, an expertise and a research uh, sort of um, topic that will be in greater and is in greater demand, um, but especially going forward. Uh, so I think it was very smart to take this time while you're in school to, um, to really get your hands into it uh, to the degree that you have. <clears throat> and lastly, I just want to say what a pleasure and really an honor it's been to work with you uh, over the last year. Um, I've really enjoyed our weekly meetings. Um, and Jemima is someone who, as you could even probably see today, uh, listens, considers feedback. Um, you know, she was always doing these very thorough, thoughtful investigations. Um, and you can see from the process sketches um, the the sort of level of, of, of inquiry, um, which is, again, what a thesis project is really all about. Um, I personally learned a lot from her discoveries, uh, and um, I'm really looking forward to seeing how, how your work unfolds and going on in the future. I hope you'll keep in touch, and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed working with you as well. Thank you. And thank you to everyone for your comments. This was a very amazing session. Terrific. Um, congratulations to my, Jemima. Thank great you. Great working with you as well. Uh, great. Well, um, we can all kind of catch a, a deep breath. That's that's for uh, thesis candidates, for thesis projects, and for um, amazing uh, dialogues. And, and so um, uh, part of the tradition here is that for each of our five um, segments, um, we, we do ask um, uh, the, uh, our distinguished guests um, to, to reflect on the work um, in the aggregate, um, the four projects that we've, uh, that we've talked about this morning, um, and, and make any, any uh, comments, um, uh, provide any insights really of, of any nature whatsoever. Um, that might strike you um, as uh, as relevant to to the work, and uh, um, just encouraging some some uh, uh, free flowing uh, dialogue for a few minutes um, uh, about about the work. Um, free association is also fine too. So, uh, guests. Yeah, I think to, I think overall, uh, at, least, at least the projects that I've reviewed today. And I'm sure I've reviewed in um, you know other previous days the the topics that I think students are um, tackling are sort of timely um, to you know what's happening uh, you know across you know across the globe really um, uh, but specifically our country with regards to you know the, the obvious uh, themes of you know social healing uh, and, and its many varieties um, but also the environmental issues you know which you know uh, 
I've sort of learned through, uh, um, you know, teaching over the last year that, you know, some, many times those two realms are sort of inextric inextricably related uh, a lot of times. And I, I want to just commend uh, the students for, you know, tackling these tough subjects and, and really doing quality proposals to try to figure out what the, at least from the built environment standpoint, what those solutions can and, and should be. Um, I would, and I, and I would say, I know we sort of talked about this um, um, uh, as colleagues uh, through, through the dialogue that we've had, but, you know, I would venture to say that, you know, some of the projects are sort of ad adventurous, um, 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 but I don't think out of the realm of possibility, um, you know, from, from some of the few precedents that have been mentioned here, um, you know, these projects, I think, are, um, you know, all of them are, are sort of possible in, in, um, in their own context. Um, so I would, you know, just encourage the students to, you know, take the feedback and, and you know, use your own architectural thought and, and process to sort of refine um, these, these great ideas that have been developed here um, and really make them complete projects. Um, um, uh, because I think all of them um, are ideas that are not out of the realm of possibility um, and are necessary projects and things to be discussed um, with, within architectural discourse. So uh, just kudos to all the students uh, and kudos to all the, the faculty and the, the, the thesis uh, chairs and, and, and committees that sort of, uh, you know, poked and prodded the students uh, to, to produce such great work. Uh, the, the work really shows. So kudos. Terrific. Yeah, I'll, I'll add, um, first of all, uh, what a great way to spend the Friday morning. Uh, you know, this was this was certainly a pleasure seeing um, such great work. What, what I think what struck me is, um, is uh, you know, the bravado, the bravery. Each one of, of the students are tackling such broad issues and, and a lot. So um, it, it's a it's a pretty dense, um, you know, meal to try to chew into, and and you all just just did it so great. And although there was progression in in, in terms of digging into the deep research and and how much you were able to really get into uh, the built expression, you know, people did that at various levels. Um, I I just think that the the um, the investment of of uh, research of energy. And the and the um, you know choice to tackle so many different um, and disparate in many ways issues is is to be commendable. Um, I think this is a fantastic group. I enjoyed the, the morning. Um, it, every every presenter had a wonderful surprise to, to keep the interest going, and uh, so keep up the good work. And I I hope to work with uh, each and every one of you in your career as you progress and see how it how it keeps going on. So great job. Terrific. Um, I, I just, I, one of the things, I, it's so interesting that I think the thing that connected these four projects is they were all dealing with a big broader issue that, that was somehow revolved around healing some aspect of the things that we're dealing with today from the environment to social issues, issues of equity, and, um, and I think you all dealt with them quite well. And, and to delve into those issues is so important. And, and what I would encourage is that those are the issues that, that interest you is you, you actually um, really think about how intertwined that they are. Um, you know, that, and resources are so scarce for projects that deal with those issues that the more things you can tackle with the same to make one thing work for three, you know, to try to, to, to try to use a multiplier and how you not only, you know, formally construct your architectural propositions, but the way you politically construct them and socially construct them, economically construct them um, is really important, right? Because we, there's so many things for us to deal with and only so, so many benefactors and projects that, that want to deal with them. Um, and I think it's it's the reason that we we Jemima, just to go back to yours want to expand that projects and project and start to think about all the other issues it touches uh, physically and in every other way. So uh, I think it's wonderful you guys are thinking about this kind of stuff and 
and rooting your work in it. Terrific. Terrific. Um, Emma, do you have uh, yeah. some things you want to say? Um, yes. I mean, it's um, even it's really late night, but um, yes. all these projects from different scales and different urban contexts really um, brought a lot of uh, exciting thinking process. But one thing I want to say is um, maybe it's uh, not only echoing um, all the previous but to, to my personal as a graduate of Maryland, I think I really uh, benefit um, from all the thorough study with uh, my professor and uh, my all my thesis um, um, critic back in time, how we um, thoroughly looking into the site context because um, nowadays um, there's many changes around us and probably uh, just expanded in the recent past year. And all these changes um, besides, um, besides and the uh, human experience um, are adding into the site context and how the, each project address towards the human experience and how, the, uh, how each candidate um, emphasis on the interaction between building and architecture is um, brought me to a lot of new perspectives and through the studies. So that is definitely something um, very interesting. And um, to echoing, you know, that whole process from urban all the way to interior um, really um, complete an understanding of um, architectural design. It's never, um, you know, with architecture degree, it's not only resides within the architecture itself. Ultimately, it's always from the macro point to the micro point as, you know, the single point of users. So I see, a, I'm really happy to see a great, great spectrum of all the student body of work, how they look into these points. Thank you and congratulations. Oh, terrific, thanks so much. Um, Brian and Lindsay, do you have uh, any any final remarks that you'd like to make? Whoop. Brian, you're muted, so I'll jump in. <laughs> um, I was going to say there are a couple other reviewers that didn't get a chance. Um, to... uh, I think Marcus has uh, had to to leave. Did uh, did we miss anybody? Uh, Dana had to leave as well. Okay. I be I believe. Um, we have okay. heard. Just making sure that everybody had, had their chance. Yep. That's all. Yeah. Lindsay, go ahead. I, I always have the final word. <laughs> I think um, it's come up a few times in uh, kind of periodic ways, but um, I think a big congratulations to the students, um, underscored by the fact that this was a totally unusual, extraordinarily challenging year to be a student, to be a person, uh, to be, you know, a creative person uh, in, in every way. So I think um, all the students overcame a lot um, in the spectrum of what it means to um, be a designer. So congratulations on your work and also congratulations on your resilience, on your resourcefulness, on um, everything you put in. Um, it's a really, really wonderful group of 19 or however many we've seen over the past few days. And it's, it really is um, a celebration of the work. I hope it felt the same way to you guys. Maybe it, it's kind of hard when it's your own and you're in the middle of it, but um, it's a celebration of all the work you put in and all the research and design and iteration along the way. So um, thanks for letting me guide some of you and um, Congratulations. Jamie, do you have something else? Uh, I do, I do not. Um, okay. Go ahead, Brian. Sure, so I, I usually as the, uh, the area chair program director, I usually like to uh, conclude uh, by making a, a couple of little thank yous and, and trying to frame this in the bigger picture. So the past couple of days, we've, we've heard uh, a lot of the reviewers talk about uh, the, uh, the students and their uh, ferocity, uh, their ability to tackle issues that are hard issues, 
and their their lack of fear in doing that. There, it, some, somebody yesterday said that the, the students were fearless, and I don't think they, they knew that University of Maryland's uh, uh, branded motto of uh, the fearless turtle. Um, so uh, I just really want to say is that there is a fearless dedication to architecture, urbanism, and landscape that the students have expressed uh, uh, through their thesis projects. And so congratulations to all of, all of the students for a tremendous job, again, under circumstances that none of us uh, have particularly in, enjoyed. I think it's worth it. I think thesis is really worth it. So, so what our guests probably don't know is that we will go as a faculty next week and, and we will have a, a meeting and we'll discuss the, uh, the outcomes of this last year. It's a sort of post-mortem uh, uh, or a retrospective of the semester. Uh, and always on the table is that thesis is just too much work. It's not worth it. Um, we really got to do something else. We have to ditch it and try, you know, just do a final project. I don't know. I mean, channel the spirit right now. And what we've heard from all of our guests, it is worth it. It is very much a, a worthwhile enterprise. Um, I, I, I think in addition to our, our reviewers for spending time with us today, uh, I want to thank the faculty because this is an overload. It's very difficult for the faculty to do this. Uh, but as I said, it's worth it. Your efforts are 100% worth it. Um, I also think it's important to thank Jamie and, uh, and Lindsay in particular for the work that they've done. Uh, they've kept us on point throughout the course of the whole, uh, in some cases, the course of the whole year and the whole semester focused on the, the prize at the end. And the past three days, a really quite smooth operation. A uh, couple little glitches here or there, but those things happen because we don't control the, the internet. But goodness, this, was, this has been really quite fabulous. And uh, finally, I really want to thank uh, Fabian Gomez and the uh, TSC uh, for making sure that this went out on social media so that it's not just us that can see this, uh, but that it's, it's, there's a big thumbs up from Fabian, the big dog there. Uh, so thank you guys for doing a great job for us as always. Uh, I know it uh, occupies a lot of your time, makes other things difficult, uh, but um, it was really worth it. Thesis is, uh, is a tradition here at Maryland. I hope to see it continue well into the future. I think it's a powerful thing. Uh, and uh, just to all of you folks, great job. Have a great summer. Go Terps. See you faculty at uh, 2 p.m. to do the thesis yes. awards. Great. Thank you so much, Brian. And thank you again to, to our guests. It's been great seeing you all and, and hoping to, to cross paths uh, soon in, in one form or another. So a Thanks bittersweet you, moment, but um, goodbye, everybody. We'll see you soon. Ciao. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.